Hello, Plural Site Live 2020. Chloe Condon here, Cloud Advocate at Microsoft, and I am so excited to be joining you remotely this year. I'm joining you, of course, from my very professional beanbag chair. <laughs> and I'm really excited to be talking about a new topic that I've been diving a little deeper into these days, AI, which if you're joining this talk, you probably saw the, the name of it and, and saw how to make AI feel less like sci-fi with AI Builder. So if you're joining, uh, hopefully you're someone who has an interest in AI or is maybe getting started with AI. I know when I was at the beginning of my AI journey, it's a little difficult to say, <laughs> um, it was very overwhelming. Um, personally, I don't have a computer science degree. I actually have a degree in theater performance. Um, and I'll get into my background and many different jobs in a second here, which relates to this talk. Um, but AI has always always felt like a very far away, unattainable kind of topic. And it wasn't until I recently uh, got started with AI and specifically playing with AI Builder that I realized just how simple and easy it is to incorporate it into some really awesome everyday activities. So without further ado, let's get started, shall we? So let me get my handy dandy slides going here. All right, so who are you? Who is this orange haired lady? talking to you on the screen here. <laughs> well, hello everyone. I'm Chloe Condon. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft. Um, I have a really cool job. I get to educate developers on how to use Microsoft and developer tools that we have here, specifically Azure. And I work with students on the academic team. Um, I am an actress turned developer, as I mentioned before. I have a theater performance degree from San Francisco State University. And I use a lot of my uh, theater background um, in what I do today as a cloud advocate. But for this particular talk, I wanted to highlight and focus on some fields that I previously worked in other than the performing arts and other than the engineering and technical side of tech. Um, so as an actress turned developer, I worked nine to five, Monday through Friday to support my artistic endeavors. And I worked as a recruiter, as an office manager, as a executive assistant. I worked in retail. Uh, my first job was at the Disney store. I was in customer support. I did many, many things. And this talk um, is inspired quite a bit by ways that I could have used the tools that I know about now as a technical person as a non-technical person. And great news, if you're watching this talk and going, oh no, I don't know how to code, that's okay. This is totally a low code, no code friendly solution to artificial intelligence. So without further ado, let's get started. So artificial intelligence, close your eyes if you want to, if it's not weird to close your eyes at home by yourself <laughs> or with your friends or family around. Um, what comes to mind when you think of the words artificial intelligence? Now for me, if you had asked me this question before I started to learn to code five or six years ago, I pictured, and sometimes still picture, the film AI starring Haley Joel Osment. And if you're not familiar with that film, uh, I've got a handy dandy poster version of it in my slides here. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, the plot of this film is all about a robotic boy who's one of the first uh, programmed to love, who's adopted as a test case by a Cybertronics employee. And it's one of the first sci-fi films that I ever saw. Um, it truly defined as a non-technical individual at the time, um, I was about 10 or 11 years old, what sci-fi was to me. And it's a fascinating commentary on robotic sentience and machine intelligence and heartbreaking film. I definitely cried at the end. <laughs> if you're looking for a good cry, I highly recommend it. Now, I didn't bring up this movie to give you a review in the stock. I brought it up because um, not only is, is, am I a big Stanley Kubrick fan, but I knew about AI uh, and the only time, thing that I knew about AI was this film. So um, AI felt above and beyond my skill set. I walked out of this movie about a robotic boy with sentience who felt emotions, it made me cry. And this, the concept of AI to me felt like a completely difficult thing that was out of my skill set. I mean, building a robot who could love way out of my, uh, my expertise. Um, although I, I do feel that I am getting closer every day at being able to hopefully build my own robot friend. Um, now, if you do a basic internet search, like an image or article search on what is AI or what is machine learning, you're gonna see a lot of images, representations, or art of some matrix style looking code overlaid as a brain, maybe some hands or a face or a body, you know, symbolizing. 
uh, that is that it's human like um, the visual representation and symbol has a very person like uh, flair to it. And that's what artificial intelligence is looking to create. It's looking to create machine intelligence that helps us make decisions and learn things that we train it to do. Um, so create simulations to help project outcomes or recognize speech and so, so, so much more many things. Now, I know we probably have a bunch of citizen developers um, who are watching this, and I'm going to assume that most folks who are watching this are either new to AI or maybe they're even a little afraid of AI, maybe, <laughs> um, or maybe becoming smart enough to uh, to make decisions and, and uh, on behalf of technology maybe feels very technical and beyond the scope or skill set of what you're able to do, or maybe you're not familiar with that. And I'm here to say that is okay, and this talk is true, really this talk is for you. <laughs> I've been there. I'm here to say it's not as much like sci-fi as you think or may perceive it to be. Um, in fact, there's ways to use artificial intelligence and machine learning in very small and easy but impactful ways that can allow you to not only become more efficient, but it can help you automate things, predict things, and gain value from any sort of data that you may have. So as I mentioned before, um, I previously worked in a number of non-technical roles before my time working as a cloud advocate at Microsoft. So as a student, uh, I held several jobs out of the, tech, uh, the technology industry. And now I clearly see that I could have made my job so, so much easier if I had known about these tools that are available to citizen developers. So I'm gonna walk through a couple demos today and examples of ways that I could have helped make my job a lot more easier and efficient by using things like AI Builder that I now have knowledge of today. <laughs> So here we go. Let's get started. So if you're unfamiliar with AI Builder, it's a no code interface that allows folks to enhance applications and business processes with AI that's super easy to build and configure with Power Apps. Now, of course, this is, a, um, you know, talking all about Power Apps, so I don't need to go into too much detail about what those are, um, but they're really, really easily implemented, no-code, low-code applications that can be made um, within the Microsoft uh, tool set. And I want to reiterate just what's so, so exciting to me about these tools for just citizen developers are not only are they available to everyone, including developers looking to save time and maybe, you know, at office admins or recruiters or people who don't have these technical expertises, um, but it also gives folks the power to create tools and enable business processes that were previously unavailable to the average citizen, like creating an application or, um, as I'll show in a, in a minute here, being able to take inventory and count objects without having to physically go in and count. And people can leverage the Power Platform and build applications faster and which with much less effort than before. So this allows people to focus their time and energy on much more important business needs. But enough about that. Let's go into a couple real life examples here from my previous life as a non-technical individual who assumed that uh, sci-fi was only for people in lab coats building robots <laughs> and see how I could have used Power Apps at a, as a citizen developer. Okay, so for lucky for y'all, I have kept every photo of me from uh, childhood into adulthood. And this picture is uh, a picture of me in a child's Buzz Lightyear costume. Don't worry, there's a reason for this. So in college, I worked in several retail jobs. And if you've ever worked in retail or have run a retail business at any point, you know that inventory management is crucial. And inventory management, for those who don't know, is going through every item in the store and accounting for them and uh, making note of them somewhere, basically, in an organized fashion. And at least once a year, stores are required to audit what items of merchandise they have in stock. And then um, that not only allows the business to obtain data, but it allows them to audit for any sort of inconsistencies. And inventory management is an essential part of business management. Um, as an employee working in retail, um, inventory night often meant staying overnight night and working in the store from midday through midnight, <laughs> um, returning home at two and three in the morning. And, you know, for a boutique store that sells maybe 400 to, you know, or 100 or so SKUs, um, this isn't too bad. But consider situations like this. I used to work at a toy store, specifically the Disney store. <laughs> and one such night, uh, my coworker and I were tasked with this very specific uh, 
task, which was counting magic towels. Now, if you're unfamiliar with magic towels, they're these little tiny towels, like I have pictured here. Um, they usually have a picture or a brand on them. And uh, working at the Disney store, which as we know, Disney has many brands and uh, characters and, and different parts of their franchise, we had to go through and count each skew of every single design. Now that is a lot of magic towels, y'all. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of magic towels, everything uh, from Mickey Mouse to Minnie Mouse to Mulan, Hercules, everything you can think of. And each towel had a unique skew um, and it was an all night task. We spent the whole night counting through them and we sat in the back room and we read skews and we counted the inventory and we uh, checked for accuracy. Well, believe it or not, this is absolutely something that could have been automated with the power of AI Builder. Um, so with object detection, which is a feature of AI Builder, we can identify and count objects within any image. And this way we're able to automate business processes based on real-time data. So I can literally take a picture of a room full of socks and it can tell me uh, a very, very good close estimate as to how many socks are in that picture. Um, of course, this requires some uh, training, which I'll get into in this demo in a second here, but uh, we can identify with images like this, low supplies, low inventory, flag unexpected items, maybe something is in the uh, wrong spot and more automatically. And you know what that means? No more counting each individual towel. <laughs> so here is an example. Um, so in this image here, we have what looks to be an image from a Microsoft store, um, and we're showing a bunch of Surface products. And each one of these items um, on the retail shelf is able to be identified by AI Builder. Now you can do this by common objects. So let's say this is a bike shop and you have um, an image that has bikes and chains and wheels and different things. You can identify it by common objects, objects on the retail shelf, and of course, brand logos. So let's say that you have a retail business, which is more common than not, that has multiple brands. Um, you would be able to identify those as well. So um, there are a couple different steps to uh, train something like this. So we have our, we're talking about machine learning, right? AI and machine learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And in order for artificial intelligence to happen, we need to train our uh, artificial intelligence to be intelligent. Um, so step one, of course, is to teach our model about our objects. Um, and this is actually pretty simple. <laughs> it's, it's not uh, something that requires a lab code and working with a robot. Um, so this literally requires selecting or defining the object names. Um, we can upload up to 15 images, or we want to upload up to 15 images of each item. So we have a proper and accurate uh, visual of what it looks like. And then I'm gonna choose what objects I want to be detected. So in this case, I'm choosing to detect different colored towels, but of course, this can also be defined by, um, you know, a inventory name or, uh, any sort of thing that you want to differentiate by um, or skew. And for the sake of clarity in this demo, I'm making them towels. <laughs> so if you're familiar with um, how you know code or machine learning or AI models work, this is basically a UI allowing us to identify objects that we've defined. So here I have miscellaneous towel, blue towel, green towel, and orange towel, a towel close to my Heart and my hair color. So next we need to add our images and tag them. And this step's really fun. Um, we need a minimum of 15 images of each item. And what we're gonna do is go through and tag each image so we can train our model. Oops, I went back a slide here, there we go. So I've got an image here of magic towels and uh, we are going to go through and identify, all right, here is our green towel, our red towel. Um, this one that I have selected here is an orange towel. And once we have done 15 of each of our items, then we are able to move forward with object detection. So then we get to publish and use our model. Um, so now that we can identify and count the objects um, with our app flows, we can go ahead and test something like this out. Um, so here's an example here with tea. Um, so this example, we have a green tea, we have a cinnamon tea and a rose tea. And we are identifying um, 
we've obviously uploaded 15 pictures of each one of these so that way it's able to detect based on the color and the words and all of the different visuals of this item that this is in fact green tea this is in fact a uh, cinnamon tea and this is in fact rose tea um pretty exciting stuff y'all so uh now let's get into um the next part of this uh, fun topic, which is form processing. Now, I'm sure we have some people who are watching who have had to process a bunch of forms, fill out a bunch of forms, or even fill out a form after someone else has filled out a form to put it online virtually, right? Um, that's probably why a lot of folks are watching this talk, is they want to know, how can I automate things with AI? How can I automate things with machine learning? I'm particularly excited about this example because I cannot tell you how many times as an office manager or as a recruiter, I was tasked with inputting forms, everything from resumes to, oh my goodness, intake forms from HR. Um, and what's really cool about AI Builder is it allows us the capabilities to automatically process documents. Um, and this saves a bunch of time on routine things like invoices, tax forms, um, processing and uh, uploading receipts, extracting that information from those tools or from those documents, I should say. Um, so this being able to use um, AI Builder to process these things is a huge, huge time saver. And I'm super excited to share with you how we can do that. Um, so step one of using um, uh, form processing would be to upload at least five different versions of the same basic document. Um, so here I've got a pretty basic invoice form um, and I have five versions of it with five different pieces of data here. So pretty simple. If you've ever, if you're uploading a form, uh, you, you hopefully have at least five of the form to upload here. So, and then you wanna go through and highlight the important areas. So really this is like going through with the highlighter, a virtual highlighter and saying, here are the different sections that come into these forms. So in this example, we have the from section, the bill to section. Um, we've also highlighted the balance due section that we have uh, hovering over here with the cursor and then the various different fields for this invoice that we've charged, the subtotal, the tax, the shipping, and the total. And usually um, on these type of forms, there isn't too much variance uh, between forms of similar nature. So once we're able to identify those things, um, we're actually able to then train our model and use this out in the world. Now, you can automate document processing in apps, um, in different flows, it's going to give you so much free time. And instead of sitting down at a computer and listening to a podcast and having to do manual data input, um, you can actually spend a couple extra minutes training your model and spend your time working on other more important uh, projects. So um, I used to be, in addition to a recruiter and, oh my goodness, what else have we touched on today? Toy store employee, all these other odds and ends jobs. I also worked as a virtual personal assistant. Yes, uh, I worked for a company called Zirtual um, early on in my career. And I uh, worked to do a lot of data entry for people who had business cards. Um, and the reason I shared this fun fact is yes, there is a uh, form tool for that as well. Um, so I wanted to share a couple more ways that you can use AI and ML with, and, and you saw that we didn't, I didn't write any code and all of those demos just involved uploading images and tagging them. Um, so it's almost like going onto a social media app and just tagging your friends <laughs> online. But there's so, so many ways that you can use these tools and features with little to no programming at all, mostly no programming. Um, business card reader. So this is literally what we just did with the form fill out, uh, form recognizing but with a business card, um, entity extraction. So that's what we did in, in the previous image that I showed there. Language detection, of course, a very, very useful tool, especially if you're doing translation services. Text recognition, of course. Um, sentiment analysis, so much fun to be had with sentiment analysis, especially when working with customers and determining moods and outcome and different customer use cases. Um, really, really cool ways to use key phrase extraction to uh, be able to get sentiment or positive and negative sentiment um, in text specifically. So um, customer support emails, um, being able to assess uh, feedback um, quickly and efficiently. So definitely, definitely check out uh, what 
can I build uh, using AI? Think to yourself, what can I use building AI now that I know what I can build uh, to automate something and make something easy and simple in my life? Um, and of course, there are all sorts of different tools and ways to work with this, um, very high code ways with our Azure Cognitive Services, very low, low code ways. <clears throat> And of course, there are many, many ways to work with AI and machine learning, no matter what kind of role you're working in, a very deeply technical role, you can use something like Azure Cognitive Services. But I hope today, if you came to this talk and maybe AI or machine learning um, is a kind of scary concept to you as a non-technical individual, that these tools can help empower you to build really cool, awesome AI and machine learning apps. Or maybe you are a technical person and you don't have the time and energy to dedicate to uh, deeply studying AI and machine learning. I hope that uh, learning about Power Apps today, and hey, check out Logic Apps as well, um, can help take some time and uh, for you to focus on other things um, that are on your plate. The links that I have here um, are two uh, really great beginner modules to get started with the Power Platform. Um, one is aka.ms slash AI no sci-fi, and the other one is aka.ms slash fun form. Um, one is gonna go over the uh, kind of a beginner introductory to using Power Apps, specifically the AI and machine learning uh, pieces of that, and then form recognizer, which I know if we've got any admin people on this call, they're like, point me to the form recognizer. That's going to be aka.ms slash fun form. And please, please reach out on Twitter. Um, my handle's been at the bottom of all the slides here if you have any questions or want any links to our resources. And I can't wait to see all of the awesome things that you develop using the Power Platform. And hey, Azure Cognitive Services as well. <laughs> Have a great rest of your portal site 2020 and I'll see you on the interwebs. Bye. Hello, Plural Site Live. My name is Cassidy Williams and I'm excited to be speaking with you today. Uh, this talk is going to be one that I haven't given before, but it's something that's very near and dear to my heart, and I'm really excited to speak to you about it. For those of you who don't know who I am, again, my name's Cassidy, and I'm a Principal Developer Experience Engineer at Netlify. Now, in my career experience, I've jumped around to a lot of different companies and, and seen a lot of different ways of productivity and ways to run things, and this talk is called Building To Do Meter, Figuring Out What Works For You, because it has taken me a while to figure out what works for me. And, it, and this is about a project to-do meter that took me a long time to build, um, not out of technical uh, difficulty necessarily, but because it was kind of me figuring out what do I want out of this application. And so once again, as I've been around at all of these different companies, I've realized that there are a little too many tools out there. And there's so many different options for how I wanted to handle task management. I had a little notebook where I still occasionally write things down and, and kind of set a, a to-do list for myself. I was using Kanban boards kind of like Trello or a Notion to move tasks over as I was finishing them. I was using GitHub issues even. I was using all kinds of different task management things and tools, um, but I really learned I'm picky. There are, there are so many options out there and there was nothing that was really sticking with me. I would download the latest new to-do app or something onto my phone and I would realize, ah, oh, you know, this just doesn't work for me. It's, it's just not something that, uh, that I could make stick. Um, and so in being picky and figuring out all these different tools and everything, I came upon this really great quote. The best way to escape a problem is to solve it. And so I was realizing, okay, why are, why are none of these things sticking? Is, is there a reason? Is it just I'm not getting enough satisfaction with making a checkbox or dragging cards over or anything? What, what is that problem that I'm trying to solve? And I realized if I couldn't figure out how to use these tools to the best of my ability to figure out how to get tasks done, I was going to have to build something myself. And so I got out my notebook, I started sketching out quite the, quite the application, trying to figure out, okay, what is the thing that's gonna make it stick for me, that it's a tool that I'm gonna wanna use. And I ended up building what is now called To-Do Meter. 
and it's a to-do list. It's a desktop application that has a progress bar in it. That is, that is the very high level summary of what this application is. But actually diving in a little deeper as to how I actually built it is kind of a more fun story. And then I'll show you the application in a bit more of a demo in a bit. So building this application, again, was a journey. If you look at this screenshot, that says January 2016 on it. And that, that is very true. I started figuring out what I wanted out of this application way back in 2016. I was sketching things out and honestly, it was something that I wanted even before then, but I didn't know what it was or, or, or anything. And, and so I finally just started not just sketching it on a piece of paper, but putting it in an actual design piece of software to actually start putting this together. Um, and so I, I was like, okay, I'm going to choose a color scheme. I'm going to get to-dos. I'm going to add a progress bar. I'm going to make it something that has kind of a more strict design system because I had never really set one up before. I wanted to make sure that I use this kind of purpley color because I like purple. I had the dark purple, the light purple. Hey, what's purple and doesn't weigh a lot? Light purple. <laughs> anyway, um, I wanted to make sure that I had kind of a good groundwork before I actually started coding something. Because so many times when I've built applications in the past, I kind of just start blabbing away at my keyboard and kind of just hoping it turns into something at the end of a given project. And so this one I wanted to be um, a bit more strict with myself. So I built icons, I built a color scheme, I built shapes and sizes. And after this whole journey, I had to do meter. And here's a little, a little URL for you to go to. And granted, it didn't take me all the way until 2020 to actually build this application, but it did take me all the way to 2020 to get it to a place where I was really happy with it. So again, if you'd like to go check out uh, To Do Meter, you can look at the URL right here. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show it to you myself. And so uh, this is this is To Do Meter. This is this is my app of the day. I have made a pun about the color purple, so I'm going to check that off. I am going to put off calling the utility company and I'm still giving my plural site live talk. So I'm not going to check it off or anything. That's still something I have to do. If I want to add something for the day, for example, I have to do the laundry. I have to, oh, what do I have to do? Oh, I definitely have to clean up the windows because I can see some birds had an activity over there. I, I have to, you know, add a few more tasks. I'm going to wash my hands and wear a mask. So as you can see, as I'm adding items to this list, slowly but surely, um, the progress bar is actually going down a little bit. And so, uh, for example, doing the laundry, I'll put that off later. Clean up the windows, I'll also do that later. I did wash my hands, I did wear a mask. So as you can see, as I check items off, the progress bar slowly fills up. And uh, if I don't want to look at the things that I've already done, I can just forget about it and ignore that. Same with the do later. If there's something that I don't want to put off anymore, okay, finally, I'm going to call the utility company. I'm not putting it off until later. I can move it back up to, uh, to the main list and kind of resume it there. And then again, I can hide that if I want to. And if I want to reset my progress completely, get rid of that progress bar, what that does is it empties out the completed item list and then it puts everything in the to-do uh, later uh, section into the main list. And so it's a fresh new slate. And so once again, I'm going to pause these ones for later. Now, this is, this is a very high level of the application, but there's a few different things that uh, you might not necessarily see at first glance. So first of all, we have the date at the top and everything. That date controls a lot more than you would think. Because when you notice I click that reset progress button, what this does is it actually resets every single day at midnight. And so when the, when the clock strikes 12, all of the items that are incompleted, they go away. Everything in the do later column goes back up to the main list. And so that, that was one thing that I thought was important because it kind of forced me to not put off everything forever. It could force me to actually have those items in my main list again. Um, it's also accessible. It's uh, keyboard navigatable, and so I can uh, move around and decide if I want to check things off or something by hitting tab here. I don't know if you can see that, but I promise I was hitting tab. And then another thing that I actually added this year was uh, notifications. And so you can enable reset notifications, and right now I have it at never because I was 
mad at myself for not finishing some tasks, but you can have it remind you every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, or every hour when, um, when you need to actually get your tasks. And it's just a native notification where if you're using it on Mac, it does it just uh, the notification on the side. If you use it on Windows, it has it in the bottom right. And honestly, I don't have a Linux computer, but it's in there. And I mentioned all these OSs, uh, it is built with Electron. And so uh, it, on the big front part, it is built with React and then uh, Electron is holding all of this together. And so that, that is what this application is at a very high level. Um, when I first built this application, these are the technologies that I used. And again, I started building it a long time ago in uh, 2016 and 2017. And so at the time, the new hotness was React and Redux, and Redux was the thing controlling the state throughout my application. I used Moment.js, which if you've kept up with the news about Moment, it is no longer being maintained and it is done, but Moment was great while it lasted. Um, I also used a UI library for uh, the progress bar at the top, and then like I mentioned, Electron to actually make the desktop application, and then Less to handle the styling. Now, this was great. When I, when I first made it, it got the job done with these technologies. Um, but first of all, when I was first building this, I didn't fully understand Redux. I, I got it, I understood it generally, but it was kind of hard to wrap my mind around it. And so when I had it all open sourced and everything, people would be asking me to implement stuff to fill out their feature requests. And I had a little bit of trouble updating it consistently because of my mind needing to be wrapped around Redux a little bit. And also I was having a little bit of trouble with the progress bar where sometimes the math was working, sometimes it was a little bit off and I just kind of had to deal with it. Um, so this whole version of To-Do Meter worked for me for a really long time. I, I kind of called it done for myself for a couple years. Um, actually a, a full three or four years. And then after a while I was thinking, hmm, you know, it should be, it should be updated. And so earlier this year, kind of right around as the pandemic was starting, I decided to do a complete rewrite where instead of using React and Redux and Moment and all of these different things, I did a complete rewrite where I ripped out Redux completely, used just React. And then with React, I also used the context API for uh, managing state and, and used the user reducer hook. And so that kind of replaced the need for Redux altogether. I switched to date FNS instead of moment.js just because it was doing a lot more and it was a lot smaller. And you know, now that moment is done, I'm very glad that I switched to it. Um, I used reach UI for the actual accordion expanding things, which I'll get into in a little bit. Still using Electron, but a much smaller, faster, and newer version of Electron, and I switched to SAS instead of less. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the details in this rewrite because I'm very proud of it. It was something that, if you look at the PR, I literally removed just under a thousand lines of code and then hundred lines of code. So it was definitely a major thing, but it had more features and it actually fulfilled some feature requests from people and did a little bit more of what I wanted. And so let's look back at the application. So first of all, one of the things that I did with Reach UI is let's just say I'm going to have a new thing um, and check it off here. With Reach UI, it has a few really nice things built in and it's accessibility first. And so the first thing that I wanted to do was make it a little bit more accessible. And so I started adding my own tabbing indexes or indices and stuff to be able to add things to the list. But with ReachUI, they had a nice accordion where this could actually do actually be done with a keyboard and I wouldn't have to write it. And that was a giant thumbs up from me. And so that was a really useful thing with ReachUI. Um, and so another thing that I did, again, I cut out Redux completely. And you might be wondering why I needed it in the first place. And technically I didn't really need to, depending on the state of the lists of everything, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it because this is where it got a little bit harder to deal with than I personally expected when I first built it and then later on. Now, all of these items in this big to-do list are just in a giant array uh, inside of here but they all are objects that have a certain state. And so they have the actual to-do item right here, but their different state is, is it something that needs to be done, something that'll be done later, a postponed, or something that's completed. 
And so adding all of these items to the list and having these states, that was kind of fine. They could, they could handle their own state really well without any sort of redux or reducers that I uh, switched to context. But it was the resetting. The resetting of the times was, oh my gosh, I can't really emphasize enough how much of a pain that was to do, both in the original and in the rewrite of this application. I mentioned the date up here, how it kind of controls that when we hit midnight, everything resets. And this is where I had to kind of get into the nitty gritty of how Electron works, as well as how uh, this application works. Now, typically what you would think is you could just say, oh, okay, well, as soon as it hits a certain time, I'll hit the reset. And so I'll change the state of these do later things to be uh, pending. And then the completed just gets removed from the list. And that's true. But you have to think about it. This is a desktop application, so it's something that's continually running. When I first started building this, I was thinking, okay, what I could do instead of just checking every single second and, and uh, kind of calculating time constantly, what I could do is first I would get the time when the application opens, calculate the number of minutes, seconds, whatever, until midnight, and then reset after that time. So it would be a nice long timeout and I wouldn't have to think about it. And that was all well and good. It kind of generally worked, except for when your computer went to sleep. And so that was a pain to deal with, honestly. It was, it was something that I, I didn't account for at first and it just ended up being such a headache later on. And so I started thinking, okay, what if I use some sort of local storage to pull things so that way the application just kind of reloads at midnight every single time. And so the resetting happened in a time check on kind of the render thread where, where the client happened. And then on the main thread where the actual desktop application happened, I would do some math and reconciliation between those. Long story short, I'm not gonna get too deep into this. It was a pain to figure out this whole reset thing. And so I ended up doing a bunch of research on performance and how time usually happens. And I realized checking things every second actually isn't that bad. I, I thought it was at first, but it's, it's not so bad. And so what happens instead of doing everything where I have to reconcile in between the render thread and the main thread, which again, the main thread handles the actual desktop application part, and then the render thread handles the React application part, I just did it all in one spot instead of reconciling it, checking the seconds when it hits midnight, it does the reset. And so that was that was a big ordeal that I had to deal with. And that was a big part of why I needed a more global store because I was handling things in, in different ways across the application. And so anyway, that, that was one of the main reasons why I took out Redux and why I was able to move things around. Another thing that I was able to do is make it responsive, which Past Cassidy was just like, eh, the application should always be the exact same size. Turns out people don't like that. And that was a really big thing that people wanted in the open source community. So guess what? You can change the application size now. This was not something you could originally do. And so as I was kind of updating everything, I realized as great as less is, I, I, I didn't mind it. Um, I was really only using it for nesting. And I wanted to do a few more nice variable things and, and mix-ins. And so that's why I ended up switching over to SAS and, and using that. And hey, not only is the inside of the application responsive, but the actual window sizes as well. When I first built this, I kind of made it a, just a set window size and that was it. And people did not like that. So very good reason for a rewrite. And uh, finally, the thing that I am also really excited about is the notifications. Now, this was actually a feature request that someone mentioned, hey, it'd be nice to be reminded every once in a while of what to do here um, and uh, to actually look at my notifications. And uh, this was something that involved getting deep into the weeds with Electron and figuring out how notifications work and making sure you can enable notifications and making this kind of compatible across operating systems ended up being a bit more of a hassle than I expected. And uh, honestly, if you're if you're building a desktop application, one of the things that you want to figure out is notifications and minimizing. That was that was something that I did not expect to be such a pain, but it was. And so uh, that, that was one of the things that I that I worked on um, to to bring to this application. And it's honestly made my experience a lot better because 
now is, instead of just kind of remembering, oh yeah, I should check my to-do list on occasion, I'm, I'm reminded of it. And what's nice uh, with the Electron API, there's some nice things where I could click contribute and it would open up the GitHub repo and you could update it. It has a nice little about thing where it says, hey, it was built by me. Um, and you can add your own desktop icons and everything. I've been really happy with it. And switching to the newest version of Electron 2 made the application so much smaller. Uh, making it smaller was not something that uh, that you were able to uh, deal with before, and it was just a very, very large application. Now, granted, Electron is not the smallest library in the world for desktop applications, but you know, it, it gets the job done. Um, and I'm really happy with the newest versions of it, and I've been trying to be relatively consistent in updating it. Um, oh, and one last feature before I forget. Uh, the resume button. This did not exist before. Before, if it was in the do later section, it was just, if you put it in the do later, that's it. And if if you do it, then you hit the check mark, and then it's done. Otherwise, uh, you're just going to have to delete it like that. Um, and I was okay with that, but that was something where users were not such a fan of, and, and typically I, because again, I built this for myself, I was like, okay, I'll take feature requests with a grain of salt, but quite a few people asked for this, and, uh, you know, resuming was a good idea, so that was something that I added in there as well. So anyway, that's, that's how the application changed a lot with all of these libraries, and I'm, I'm genuinely really happy with, with where it went, and it's something that I really use a ton now. It's, it's something that I'm really happy with. And so there were a lot of lessons that I learned with all of this and, and really just what works for you doesn't work for everyone. When I first released To Do Meter and I was just like, tell the world about my to-do application, um, I got a ton of feature requests. And I told you about some of them that I implemented um, from people and, and there were some few uh, contributions from folks in the open source community. but some people were adding a little too much for what I wanted. And, and you kind of have to be discerning when you get these feature requests from people, if you're building a tool for yourself and you make it open source to the world. Because as I was starting to consider some of the options that people wanted and some of the abilities people wanted, for example, having a to-do list for every day of the week and being able to schedule to-dos and, and kind of just being able to drag and drop and, and do all of these extra things, it was starting to do things that I just didn't need. And it was something where I started to just tell people, you know, I appreciate that you want this. This is great, but also this is why it's open source. If this is a tool that is not working for you in some capacity, you can fork it and build that feature for yourself. And that that's kind of what I hope is the essence of this project. If you want to use it, great, and I hope you do. But if you don't want to use it, build one yourself or, or use something else. And and uh, learning that lesson of what works for you doesn't work for everyone was something where I had to learn it both in building an application for myself, but also in building an application for other people and using other people's tools. There are people out there who swear by using a certain framework, who swear by using a certain productivity tool, who swear by using a certain note-taking tool. And this is this is kind of where I become like, Mama Cass, I'm going to tell you some things. Oh, I should have made some kind of mamas and papas joke there. Eh, they'll do it next time. Anyway, this is where I want to tell you, you should never put down people for really appreciating a certain tool or for using a framework that's different from yours. You shouldn't be just like, ah, you know what, React sucks its view all the way or, or something like that, because that doesn't really help anyone. People do have their own preferences for different things. And building this tool is a really lesson in that for me, not only in making this application and figuring out what I wanted out of it, but also in realizing that I can't please everyone in building this application. And, you know, some people, they just need to find a tool that works for them or build it for themselves. So there's this great quote, quote from Arthur Ashe that I wanted to bring up. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. If your current workflow isn't working for you or you're just kind of forcing yourself to stick with it, or you're just kind of going with what your team wants you to do, the, it, it's understandable. I've, I'm one who has switched coding editors or, or done something to kind of appease a different group of people. Uh, you don't have to. If, if, if you are working on your own personal projects or you're kind of figuring out your own preferences and how you work and how you study, 
Now is the time to kind of experiment with what works best for you, especially in this time of remote working and, and kind of figuring out your working from home setup and figuring out what you'll do when you go back to the office, that sort of thing. You're going to have to figure out what works best for you. And so start where you are with that. Figure out where what is what is the thing that is working for you great right now? What is the thing that you need to update or change? What are the problems that you're having? What's kind of meh, what's great, what's not so great? And use what you have to solve those problems. Use what you have to enhance those solutions. Figure out what, what are your abilities, what are the tools you have, what are the processes in your brain that you can use to get rid of the problems, to improve the things that are kind of meh, and to emphasize the things that are great. And this might be a productivity tool for you, like it was for me, but it might be something else. It might be how you take notes. It might be how you attend meetings. It might be the tools that you have at your desk. But figure out how to use what you have to do what you can you should figure out how to solve these problems so that way you can be the best that you can be at work and then maybe the solutions that you've provided have been will be useful for someone else and i know that with to do meter it's not the most popular to do app out there by a long shot there are plenty of other robust to do applications that people adore but I do have a small little contingent of people where they love to do meter and it's something where it just gets the job done for them. And it brings joy to my heart when I see them messaging me about it on Twitter or, or even writing an issue on GitHub just saying, hey, this is great. Um, and it solves that problem for them. And it's a way to kind of give back to your community if a process that you come up with, a tool that you build, something is useful for other people. And so that being said, do that. I want to thank you all so much for having me here today. I had a blast talking to you about this application because, once again, this was something that took me quite a while to build uh, and a lot of iterations and everything, but it was something that I I kind of just put a lot of thought and effort into, and, and I hope that it can be a guiding light for you, a lesson for you in, in how to build something, how to figure out what actually works for you, and uh, how to just kind of move forward in this very funky world we live in where we're all kind of working from home and trying to optimize everything for, your, for ourselves. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Actually, I think we're kind of at the end of the conference, so I hope you have a great time um, and a, a great rest of your week, great weekend. Thank you again so much for having me. I've been Cassidoo. If you want to reach me, it's at Cassidoo, C-A-S-S-I-D-O-O, -S -S -O -O, and you can find me on Twitter, on GitHub, and once again, you can download To Do Meter for yourself as well. Thanks again. Hello, my name is David Tucker, and I'm glad you're joining me here for a conversation about your development strategy. Now, I hope this talk is going to apply to you, whether you're coming at this as a technology executive and you're trying to determine what your strategy is for your organization, or whether you're coming at this from the business side and saying, I really want to figure out how my business strategy links with my development strategy. That's in essence what we're talking about today. How are the two of those aligned? Now, just to give you a little bit of background on myself. So I've spent over 15 years working in consulting with everything from startups to enterprise organizations. And one of the things that I've seen, especially in recent years, is that we're getting our development strategies and business strategies completely out of sync. Now, why is this important? Well, one of the reasons that this is important is because in today's climate, the primary driver for industry disruption is the speed of digital innovation. That means that for most businesses, their ability to compete and compete against rapid disruption that we see happening in most every industry is how fast they can innovate digitally. That means they need to be able to make a decision, test it, validate it, adjust, pivot, re-implement a new solution, and be able to push it out continually. Gone are the days when we can build in changes and maybe push out a few tweaks every quarter. We need to be able to do this continually. And the best companies that exist today are doing this daily. Now, 
As we look at what Mark Benioff says, the Salesforce CEO, he says that speed is the new currency of business. That means speed needs to be the link between our business strategy and our technology development strategy. Now let's talk about some different aspects of disruption. So we're gonna be focused here today on the cloud because I believe the cloud is a unique enabler for the speed of digital innovation. But let's take a minute and let's look at the kind of disruption that's happened over the last decade, because this will help us focus our efforts as we look at how the cloud can help us with our development strategy. So first of all, when we're looking at different aspects of disruption, we have reducing user friction as a key enabler. We've seen businesses come up like Uber that totally changed that experience that we have when we're jumping into a taxi. We have companies like Stripe that decided to completely remove the user friction for developers in integrating payments into their applications. We also have companies like Airbnb that totally changed how we go out and find places to stay when we travel. Now, in addition, we have aspects of disruption tied to adopting emerging technologies. We have companies today like Textio, for example, that provides an AI augmented writing experience for job descriptions. We have other companies like Isertus, which provides a blockchain and AI enabled contract platform. And these companies are possible because of these emerging technologies. Now, in addition, we also see companies really disrupting things with automating complex operational tasks. I think both InsureTech and FinTech are really seeing a lot of advancements in this space with things that used to take humans 10 to 20 hours to do. They're now able to automate many of these things with technology. Now we also see here that creating a new customer segment could be an interesting approach for disruption. And we see companies that have gone through and done some really unique things like Robinhood, for example, that has made active investing more a part of Americans daily lives. And so with these different aspects of disruption, let's think about how the cloud enables us to achieve disruption like this. And I really think there's three key ways that we can use the cloud to really build in disruption, but this only works if we've aligned our strategies. So first, developing a data core competency. Now, data strategy used to be something that we talked about just in terms of technology, and maybe your, your IT group would need to come up with a data strategy. But here's the truth. Data is your business. Whether you realize it yet or not, for most every industry, data is a key aspect of your business. I've even seen traditional businesses build an entirely new line of revenue with the data that they already have. So you need to have a data core competency within your organization. And the fastest way to get there is going to be through the capabilities provided by the cloud. Next, we have deep user personalization. This is another example where we're going to need some external capabilities here because gone are the days when users just want to get blasts from the companies that they work with. No, they want to be able to have every message, every interaction be tailored to them. And this is going to tie in a lot of different technology capabilities, some of which are gonna be provided by platforms, but some of which are gonna be specific to your organization. Now, in addition, we also have increasing operational efficiency. I've seen some amazing things in this space. I mentioned it earlier, tied to FinTech, as well as InsureTech, that we're seeing a lot of progress here. But for many organizations, they're literally changing the way they do work by how they're using technology. Now, let's level set for just a minute. Because when I talk about the cloud, there's a lot of different aspects of the cloud we could be talking about, from public cloud to private cloud to hybrid cloud. For the purpose of today, when I'm talking about the cloud, I'm gonna be talking about the public cloud. Because I believe that for most organizations, irrespective of size, their greatest ability to increase their speed of digital innovation lies within the capabilities of the public cloud. And I'm really gonna be focusing my efforts when I'm talking about the cloud today, I'm really gonna be talking about the industry leaders. And if we look at Gartner, the leaders in their magic quadrant are going to be Amazon with AWS, Microsoft with Azure, and Google for Google Cloud Platform. So really this is where we're seeing the innovation happen. Now there certainly are some up and comers like the Alibaba cloud, but we're really gonna be focused on those three leaders in this presentation today. So here's the reason why I think this is so important. 
And that is that the cloud can serve as a key enabler for the speed of digital innovation. Now, I quickly wanna run through just some general benefits of adopting the public cloud. Now, for some of you, this is going to be information you've known for a long time, but for some of you, especially if you're coming at this from a non-technical perspective, I wanna be sure you have a chance to review these. Now, these are actually provided by AWS. So I'm just providing kind of a, a separate opinion, even from my own, about the benefits of the public cloud. So first of all, one of the huge benefits that we see is that organizations get to trade these large upfront capital investments that they would have with their own data centers, and they get to trade that for a variable expense tied to how much of the cloud they're actually using. In addition, they also get to benefit from the massive economies of scale. And I think here, most people, when they hear this, they're immediately thinking of, oh, buying servers and buying routers and networking equipment. And here, one of the benefits of scale you don't wanna miss out on is they figured out how to own and maintain their data centers at a massive scale. So what they might be able to do with one person, they might be able to accomplish 10 times as much as you can with one of your people maintaining a data center because of those economies of scale. In addition, they also can stop guessing capacity. So here's one of the great things, unless you're Netflix or Facebook, you can pretty much rely on the public cloud being able to provide you with whatever capacity that you need. You no longer have to guess at how big you need to build your data centers to be. Next, it also increases your speed and agility. And we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about how it does that, because that's one of the areas we are most interested in. Next, it also allows you to stop spending money on maintaining data centers. And in addition, you can go global in minutes. So if you're a company, even if you're a brand new startup, you have the ability to now deploy your resources globally and take advantage of the global scale of the public cloud. Now there's really two approaches I wanna talk about for how you can ultimately increase your speed of digital innovation. And in doing so, I'm hoping that you'll see where you might be out of sync with your business and your development strategy. So let's look at our first approach, and that is cloud native development. And here's what I mean by this. If you want to achieve all of the benefits of the cloud, you have to change how you build solutions. This is absolutely critical. If you're still building applications today, the same way you were five years ago, you're missing out on massive opportunities that exist. And as a note here, this is another reason why it is so important that you make sure that the people that work within your technology organization have access to training that's going to enable them to stay up to date with the trends that are going on in the technology industry. Now, for something to be truly cloud native, I say that it needs to meet four different pillars. Now, for some of you, you might've heard this term cloud native and think that it's associated with specific projects or specific types of solutions. And really here, I'm meaning this more generally. What I mean is a cloud native application is one that is built for the cloud on day one. In other words, it was completely built for the cloud. It wasn't something that you did a lift and shift and just somehow made it work in the cloud. No, it was fundamentally built for the cloud. And I identify four different pillars. Now, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time going through each of these because some of these are really complex technical topics, but I wanna call them out here. The first here is microservices. And what this means is you're choosing to build your applications in small modular units as opposed to building giant units that become very difficult for you to maintain over time. And I'll give you an, an example of this. I worked with one client that it took them eight weeks every time they wanted to release code because all of their code was so interconnected that they had to do massive amounts of testing to determine if they had introduced any unwanted adverse effects with every single release. And that completely slowed their organization down. That's an example of what we don't want to have happen within our organizations because our speed of innovation at that point can never be faster than our release cycle. Now, the next pillar here is managed services. And we're gonna spend some time talking about this, but at the core here, we're choosing to rely on services that are provided by the public cloud as opposed to building and maintaining our own. Next, we have continuous delivery. And this ties a little bit back into what I was mentioning with microservices. What we mean here is, is that we're automating all aspects of how we deliver software, including how we test it. 
And this becomes critical because we see now that we need to be able to get to the point where we can release at least weekly, if not more often. And again, the best organizations that exist today are doing this daily and multiple times per day. And the fourth pillar here is high availability. One of the benefits that we gain when we're working in the cloud is we gain the ability to enable high availability and fault tolerance. Our applications can grow and scale and shrink and fix themselves if problems occur, and it does all of this automatically. But for us to understand some of the true benefits of a cloud native application and why this should be a key part of your organization's development approach, let's take a look at some of the different cloud computing models. So first, let's start off here with a spectrum. And this spectrum is gonna go from the far left to the far right. And on the far left, we're gonna have maximum control. And on the far right, we're going to have minimum maintenance. And here's just a true fact I need to throw out here. You can't have both. You can't have a solution that gives you every bit of control you could ever want and simultaneously also have an option that provides the minimum amount of maintenance for you. So you're gonna to have to choose one or the other. Now the cloud provides a wide range of services. When we look over on the far left, we're gonna have infrastructure as a service or IaaS. And all of these ones I'm gonna mention here end in AAS for as a service. So infrastructure as a service means we get to spin up servers in the cloud, just like we would spin up a server within our own data center. Now this gives us the maximum amount of control. So here in the cloud, we're not gonna manage the data center, we're not gonna manage like the networking layer and all of those things, but we can have access to a virtual server. Well, if we go all the way over to the right, we're going to have software as a service or SaaS. This means we're just using a service that somebody else like the cloud provider provides to us. We don't have to manage anything, we simply use the service. So there's very little control with that, but there's also very little maintenance. We don't have to worry about maintaining this long-term, that's done by whoever is providing the service. Now there's other options here, we have platform as a service and functions as a service. There's a lot of different models, but I wanna explain how this plays out for you when you're talking about building your own application. Now, I'm gonna give you a bit of a warning here. I'm going to be talking here about some services that exist on a public cloud platform called AWS. You don't need to know anything about these services. I'm simply using this as an example to help you illustrate how some organizations might be misaligned on their strategy. So let's look here at a control spectrum. And here on this one, we're going to say that if we go over all the way to the right, we're gonna have the maximum amount of control. And let's say for a minute, we wanna launch an application that's going to do some document processing for us. Well, there's a lot of different ways we could go about this. Let's say one of them is we wanna launch a Kubernetes cluster using Amazon's EKS service. So this would give us all the control we need. This would enable us to scale and do everything we need to do. Now, we could choose to take an approach here that would have a little bit less control and we could use Amazon's container service called ECS, Elastic Container Service. And that gives us a little bit less control, but it still gives us a good deal of control compared to some other approaches. Now, we could go even further to the left and say, you know what, let's just, we'll spin up our own virtual servers using the Amazon EC2 service. We won't worry about building out these container clusters, but we'll still need to manage these servers. That's one approach. And then we have Amazon Fargate, which this is a service that totally manages the underlying layer, but still allows us to deploy containers. Now we could go all the way over, almost completely to the left. And we have a service here called AWS Lambda. And this is what we would call a serverless compute service or functions as a service. Now, what you choose here is going to be dependent on what the needs are for your organization. But you need to understand this isn't just a control spectrum. This is also a risk spectrum. So as we move further to the right and we gain more control, we increase our risk in terms of the amount of time we're gonna to have to spend with maintenance. We increase the risk in terms of what we have to keep up and running. And that's critical because if you look at companies like Equifax, it proved that maintaining their servers effectively was a huge risk for the organization. And that's why we're now seeing them in the middle of a complete transition over to the public cloud. Because there was a shift that happened and it really happened because of Equifax and previous data breaches like what we saw with Anthem Healthcare here in the States. 
And that was organizations shifted from saying, oh no, I can't put data in the cloud, it's not secure, to I can't keep data in my own data center, it's not secure. We're now seeing organizations embrace the cloud because it dramatically lowers their risk. And here's the standard that I believe needs to be worked into your development strategy. An organization should always build to the minimum amount of risk and maintenance required for a solution. And what we see more often than not is organizations are building way too much. If Amazon or Microsoft or Google provides a managed database for you, that is going to decrease the amount of time you have to spend maintaining your own database cluster. If they offer for you a service for messaging within your application, that's going to require less maintenance than if you have to maintain that yourself. One of your goals should be that the individuals within your organization, that a majority of them are spending time building net new functionality, net new value for your business, and not simply maintaining what's there. We are seeing rapid enterprise adoption of managed services on public cloud platforms. And as you can see here within this graph, we're seeing the relational database services leading this, but we're also seeing containers as a service, data warehousing, no uh, NoSQL databases, serverless architectures. We're seeing so many of these things catch on because organizations are starting to realize that they will actually be able to do more if they own less. But if you never have this conversation within your organization, most technology groups within a company are going to build to the maximum amount of control because that's gonna give them future flexibility. But what they need to understand is that if they build to the maximum amount of control, they are slowing down and not increasing the organization's speed of digital innovation. Now with this, I also need to bring up another point, and this is gonna be a controversial point, but let me just be honest, you need to hear this. And that's this, if you try to build a solution to work for every public cloud, you won't achieve the benefits of any of them. This is an important point you need to get. And let me explain why. This really is just common sense. There aren't directly analogous parts to the public cloud. It's not like every public cloud provider built to the same blueprint. So let me give you an example. On AWS, there is a very powerful NoSQL database called DynamoDB. We also have another great multimodal database that has a lot of scalability on Azure called Cosmos DB. These two things don't work identically. To really get the benefits out of them, you're going to have to model your data and structure your application differently based on which one you're using. Now, could you choose to in essence build for the least amount of functionality between the two of them and maybe have something work on both? Sure, but why would you want to? when you could build and use the power of each of those to its fullest. So I know there's a lot of money to be made out there and people selling platforms for things to work across clouds, but if you're doing that, you will not realize the full benefits of using the public cloud. Now, next, one of the things I've also seen, most of my clients have been able to reduce the amount they have had to build for the cloud by about 30%. So they're not having to build out, again, enterprise messaging systems. They're not having to build out custom authentication and authorization systems. They're not having to go in and build in custom logic around how they scale their database. These things are just included. So they get to build less and increase their organization's speed of digital development. Now, let's look here at just the overall benefits of taking this cloud native approach. First is it lowers your cost of trying out new ideas or business processes. No more having to go out and buy new servers and spin up new portions of your data center. You can just try things the moment you desire to do so. Next, it reduces the time that is required to maintain infrastructure. And this is a big one here because this means your people are able to spend more time building new things. Now, don't get this wrong. Some people will come in and approach this and say, oh, this is a huge cost savings. And it may be for your organization, but that shouldn't be your primary driver here. Because in a lot of ways, if you build up an effective use of the public cloud, you might, you might end up spending just as much money as you would if you were launching your own data centers. But the difference here is your speed of digital innovation has greatly increased. Next, you reduce the risk for your organization around security and compliance. So if you're choosing to use, for example, software as a service, platform as a service, even infrastructure as a service, there are ways that you're owning less than if you had your own data center. 
You're not having to worry about managing data center access, the networking layer, making sure you have redundant power, making sure you're updating the hypervisor layer. These are all things that you don't have to worry with when you're using the public cloud. In addition, it also reduces your cost of owning applications in the long term, because in most cases you're reducing your maintenance. You simply get to build out new functionality. Now there's always going to be some maintenance, but our goal should be to reduce that as much as possible. And also, and this is what we've mentioned already, people within your organization can be more focused on building new value instead of just maintaining what you have. Now let's talk about some general concepts to embrace if you're ready to move in this direction with cloud native applications. First, your organization needs to embrace infrastructure as code. This means no more manual configuration of infrastructure. Once you move to the cloud, you can define all of this in code. Also serverless architectures. This is something that doesn't fit every use case, but when it does fit the use case, it's pretty much always the best choice. This is really moving more towards that functions as a service type approach when you can. Also manage NoSQL databases. We've been using relational databases since, well, well, it feels like the beginning of time, but really here we're seeing a lot of advancement in the cloud with NoSQL databases that were built for the cloud. This gives us the kind of scale that companies like amazon.com use, and that's what we want for our applications. Also here, manage machine learning suites. If any of you are trying to spin up your own machine learning infrastructure, unless you're one of a few specific types of companies, you're making a mistake. You can rely on the public cloud providers, machine learning suites to be able to do everything you need to do in the ML and AI space. And we'll talk more in just a minute about how you could onboard ML and AI capabilities within your organization using the public cloud. Next, manage container services. This one is critical. And here, I also wanna call something out. Don't automatically go to the most complex way of deploying your containers. Just like with everything else, take the option that has the minimum amount of maintenance and risk for your organization. And next, look at some of the modern rapid application development tools. Tools like AWS Amplify that attempt to automate best practices within the public cloud. So one approach you can take to really increase your organization speed of digital innovation is cloud native development. But let's talk about another one, and that is how you integrate emerging technologies. So one of the reasons that this ties into the cloud is because the cloud can enable you to onboard these emerging technologies in a fraction of the time. So let's talk about how we would do this. And we're gonna compare here, implementing machine learning solutions locally versus doing it with a cloud native approach in the cloud. So let's take these two and let's really compare how we would do this. And let's start with the traditional approach, assuming we were trying to build out this capability within our own data centers. Now, the first thing we would need to do is we would need to go out and hire new team members. Most organizations don't have data science professionals or individuals that are experienced in deploying GPU-based hardware into our data centers just laying around. So we're gonna need to go out and get these capabilities. As mentioned, we're gonna need a new type of hardware to really facilitate this. We see that many types of machine learning are gonna require GPU-based hardware and specifically high-powered GPU-based hardware that's gonna enable us to do some complex work when we are going through and actually training our models. Also, we're gonna to need to build out a data science approach and we're gonna to need to define that and test it. And only then can we start the process of really building out our custom models. And once we do that, we'll need to test our custom models and then ultimately then we can operationalize it. But let's talk about a different approach. One that takes more of a cloud native approach to integrating this new emerging technology. So here within Amazon, and I'm just gonna use them as an example, we have a set of services called the AI services. And these are services like Comprehend, Lex, and Forecast. And Forecast, as an example, enables you to pump in some existing data and use it to predict a future value. Maybe you wanna predict your sales amount for next month based off of some historical data. We also have services like Textract that enables us to pull data out of documents, Kendra, which is enterprise search, Transcribe, which is gonna be able to transcribe to text from audio, Fraud Detector, which is just what you'd think, Recognition, which is their computer vision service, Personalize, Translate, Poly, there's a ton of them and you get access to some of the logic that goes into services like Alexa. 
Now, with this being said, we can use services like this at the beginning to help achieve some value even when we don't have a core competency in machine learning and AI just yet. And let me explain how that works. So let's look here at another spectrum. This is gonna be how we implement machine learning within our organization. Let's say we wanna be able to help predict sales data in the future. Well, this is gonna start off with some research because no matter which approach we take, we need to figure out roughly what our goals are for this initiative. Now, once we have this, we could say, well, let's just take a first pass using a managed service like Amazon Forecast. Instead of having to go through and do everything we would need to do to build this out traditionally. Now, if we did this and we saw great success within the organization, you know what, at this point, we could choose to go out and expand and begin to look at hiring a full data science team. Then if we wanted to, we could then shift to a using more of an auto ML type solution. So here on AWS, we have Amazon SageMaker Autopilot. There's an equivalent service over using Azure ML. But with this, you're able to use something that's a little bit more automated. But once you build this out, you could then go through and create a complete model continuous delivery pipeline where you're piping in your organization's data into a pipeline and building out a custom model. And with this, we can see that the time and maturity is gonna be increasing as we move to the right. So with this approach, you can actually get value from the very beginning before you even go out and attempt to hire a full data science team. So why would we go about doing it this way? One is it allows for a growing level of expertise over time. We don't have to do the big spend up front. We can achieve some value and then grow our experience. It decreases the time to achieve value which is critical. We need to be able to get in, either get value from something or just consider it a failure and move on. This is one of the pieces that is essential to innovate is that we need to be able to fail quickly. It also lowers the early implementers cost. I can tell you a lot of organizations I worked with that were exploring blockchain in the early days would go out and spin up their own clusters and they'd have to maintain it and there were continual updates and they had problems making it work. That's the early implementers cost. When here, if you choose to rely on some of the services that are available, once they're made available in the public cloud, it will decrease your cost of onboarding these new technologies. So as we look here, we have two different approaches. We have the cloud native development approach and how we onboard new and emerging technologies. Both of these really help us accomplish our core goal here, which was we wanna increase our speed of digital innovation. Now. If you're interested in learning more about the cloud, I would encourage you to check out some of my courses on Pluralsight. If you're brand new to the public cloud, I would encourage you to take a look at the AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner Path. There is a course in here called Fundamentals of the Cloud, and this will help you get up to speed with learning how to use the public cloud. I also have courses across different AWS services, as well as the different Azure services all the way from machine learning to just building out Node.js applications. So whatever your interest is, I believe I have something for you with the courses that I have on Pluralsight. But I wanna encourage you today to begin having the conversations about making sure that your business strategy and your development strategy are aligned to increase your speed of digital innovation. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Jessica Barker. I'm the co-CEO of Sygenta and the chair of Club CISO, and I'm delighted to be presenting today, Fear and Loathing in Cybersecurity at Pluralsight Live. I've worked in cybersecurity for the last 10 years, focusing on awareness, behavior, and culture. So I really help people understand cybersecurity better, what it means to them, what they can do to better protect themselves. And I work with organizations to help them understand how they can more effectively raise awareness of cybersecurity, what they can do to positively influence behaviors, and how they can build a more effective, more positive, and more robust cybersecurity culture. I'm also the author of the number one best-selling book, Confident Cybersecurity. It was recently published by Kogan Page, and I'm delighted to see it's had such a good reception. 
For me, that really shows that people do want to learn more about cybersecurity. Many people do want to progress and work in this industry, or whether they're a board member or a member of the general public. Lots of people now understand that cybersecurity is relevant to them and they need to know more about it. But when we come to help people learn more about cybersecurity, I'm a big advocate of being more positive with this, of not just relying on fear, uncertainty and doubt. And I'm using this presentation to outline why I advocate a more positive approach to cybersecurity. So I hope by the end of it, you'll agree with me that there's a lot more we can do than simply trying to scare people into better security practices, because often when we do that, it backfires on us. So it's my pleasure to be here as part of Plural Site Live, and I really hope you enjoy this presentation. What I'll be covering today, firstly, what is fear? What does it mean? How can we understand it? And moving on from that, how can we better understand the psychology of fear appeals? So fear appeals are messages that use fear to try to prompt behavioral change. And there's been a great deal of psychological research looking at fear appeals and how we as humans respond to them. So that will lead me into a discussion of actually how we can talk about something scary like cyber insecurity in a way that is effective and how we can then move beyond fear rather than just trying to use fear, uncertainty and doubt, but how we can actually use more effective mechanisms to encourage people to engage in cyber security. So what is fear? We may think we inherently know what fear is, but it's worth taking a moment just to acknowledge that fear is an emotion. So psych the psychology of fear explores actually how we as humans respond emotionally to the presence or the experience or the sight of something dangerous. The sociology of fear looks at how fear manifest manifests itself socially and culturally, because while fear is something that we may experience as humans individually, it is also something that is socially constructed and passed on. So what do we mean by this? Well, if we think about it, fear, while we may think it's something that we just impulsively experience, actually, depending on who you are, the context of a situation and your experiences, how you experience fear will differ. So the sociologist Tudor explains to us using the example of a safari and how we feel about a tiger. Most of us will think if we experienced a tiger, um, we would be scared if, if one suddenly confronted us. But actually, depending on the context and depending on our experiences, the level of fear we may feel is going to be very different. So if you're alone in the jungle and you see a tiger without much preparation, you are going to feel much more scared of it than if you are part of a safari group and you're with a trained safari leader, you are on an experience where you are hoping to see wild animals, your leader has all the equipment, you feel confident there in their abilities. In that situation, you're gonna feel much less fear than if you're just on your own and you stumble across a tiger. If you are the trained safari leader, then you're going to feel very different to the group that you are shepherding. You are trained, you are experienced, this is your job, this is something you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you're prepared for it, so you're going to feel much less fear than the safari group that you are overseeing. And if you're a hunter, you're going to feel very differently again when you experience a tiger. If you're a hunter compared to a safari group or a safari leader, when you see a tiger, that represents something completely different to you. That maybe represents your dinner or your rent. Um, and so you're going to feel excited and much less fear so just from that quick example alone, we know that fear actually isn't something that is universally felt. It really depends on who we are and our experiences as to how we respond to a perceived danger. But fear appeals have been used for a long time um, by humans to try to change behavior. So fear appeals are messages that use fear to try to promote behavioral change. and. 
This can come in many different forms. For example, most of us will be familiar with cigarette packets that have messages on conveying the dangers of smoking, um, advert campaigns that talk about um, the dangers of drinking and driving, and we'll try to um, scare us into the correct behavior. So fear appeals are used an awful lot. We're all very familiar with them. And in cybersecurity, we also often use fear appeals. We try to change people's behavior online by scaring them. So we've been using, as humans, fear appeals in society for many decades. And what's been of interest to psychologists is that sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So there's been a great deal of research over many decades to try and consider actually why do some work and why do some actually sometimes not even just fail, but backfire and lead to more negative behaviors than before the fear appeal? One of the first psychological experiments looking at fear appeals and our response to them was conducted by um, a psychologist called Leventhal and a team that he was leading. And this was in response to the fact that many people were not taking the tetanus vaccination. And so Leventhal was asked to explore whether people could be scared into getting the tetanus vaccine. So Leventhal conducted some experiments, particularly using university students to see whether they could be scared into getting the vaccine. His team took one group of students and gave them scary messages about tetanus. Um, showing them imagery of, you know, how bad tetanus can be, talking a lot about the symptoms, really scaring people about tetanus. Another group were given all of that scary messaging, but they were also given a very strong message on how to take action against tetanus. They were told about the vaccine, they were given a map of the campus, they were given directions to the health center, they were told what time the health center was open, they were encouraged to make an appointment to have the vaccine. So they were given much more support in what they can actually do to mitigate the threat. Both groups expressed strong fear about tetanus and both expressed a strong intention to get the vaccine. But group two proved much, much more likely to actually go ahead and get the vaccine when the researchers checked on both groups weeks later. This and then multiple research studies since then have shown that actually just talking about the threat is not enough. Subsequent research since Leventhal and the tetanus vaccine has shown that actually it's more effective to talk not too heavily about the threat, but much more strongly about the messages around mitigation, what people can do actually to overcome that threat. So this research has led to what is known as the extended parallel process model. And this was built on the experiments conducted by Leventhal. The extended parallel process model explains how we respond to a fear appeal. When someone tells us a scary message, as humans, we subconsciously appraise the threat and we decide whether we think the threat is real and whether we believe we as individuals are susceptible to it. Only if we decide the threat is real and we are susceptible to it, will we move on to consider the actions being recommended to us. If we're motivated to appraise the actions being recommended to us, if we think the threat is real and we are susceptible to it, we will then think those actions being recommended, are we capable of those? Can I afford them? Do I have the time for them? Is that something I understand and I'm able to do? And do I feel like that'll actually work in reducing the threat? Only if we think the threat is real, we are susceptible to it, and the actions being recommended are something that we are capable of doing and we have the ability and the time for and will actually work, only then will we engage in controlling the danger. Only then will we actually try and follow the behaviours being recommended. If we don't think the threat is real, if we don't think it applies to us, or if we don't think the recommended actions would reduce the threat, or we don't think we're capable of engaging in those actions, then we engage purely in controlling the fear, the emotional response to the danger, rather than the danger itself. 
So we don't engage in any of the messages being recommended, the behaviors we should follow. Instead, we go into an emotional response that covers things like avoidance, we'll become tired, we'll switch off, we'll think, well, what's the point? Hackers are gonna get my data anyway, so why should I bother? I'm not technical enough, I don't understand this, it's too difficult, it too, takes too long. Um, or we may just think, actually, I'm so scared of the internet that I'm just not gonna bother using it. So people will bury their heads in the sand and we've lost them. So if we really want security messages to get through to people who are not in security, then we need to make sure our messages are tailored to them, that people understand that actually this does apply to them as individuals. We also need to make sure we provide them with the tools to manage the danger and we need strong efficacy messages to empower people so they feel not just motivated but also confident to engage in the behaviours we recommend. So how do we do that? How do we help people feel more confident with cyber security? Well, in the next section of the presentation, I'm going to cover some mechanisms that I have found to be really helpful and actually how the research backs this up. One of the most important things we can do is reduce the noise. If we tell people, as I've seen with many organisations, 10, 20, 100 things that they need to do to improve their security, then we've absolutely lost them. This is a weak e efficacy message because it's overwhelming and people think there's too much to do. I can't do all of this. What's the point? Um, I'm just not going to engage in it. So it's up to us in the security industry to focus on a few things, to do risk assessments of our organization and the behaviors people are engaging in, and then to prioritize our messaging around that. We need to focus on changing behaviours one or two at a time, giving people a maximum of five things to do because any more beyond that is just noise, it is very weak efficacy message and people will not be able to engage in it. Another thing that's hugely important, which I think is really demonstrated by the research, is that we need to communicate how people can manage the threat. There's no point raising awareness of a threat if there's no way for people to manage that threat or if you're not giving people the tool to manage that threat. Instead, what will actually happen is your awareness raising efforts will be undermined, not just in this campaign, but in future ones. For example, if your colleagues are required to have different logins, if they have to have many different passwords that they need to manage, if you're telling them understandably to have a unique strong password for each login and maybe that the passwords have to be changed every few months because of regulations, well then you can't ask them to do that unless you, for example, provide them access to a password manager and run very accessible workshops on how to install and use password managers. We must only ask people to change their behaviours when we give them a viable way to manage that change. If we don't do that, we are scaring them without an efficacy message and they will simply engage in the emotion that that elicits. They will switch off, they will feel overwhelmed, they will feel like security is too difficult and we've not only lost them in terms of that one behaviour, but you're creating a narrative for them that is going to make it very challenging for other messages in the future. It's also really important, as the research has shown, to make people feel engaged and confident about security. We need to move away from people feeling intimidated and overwhelmed, feeling that security is the department of no. We need to move them from feeling scared to ask what they may think of as a basic or even stupid question that exposes their lack of technical knowledge. We want people to feel intrinsically motivated to engage in security. And that's something that can feel challenging on the face of it, but there are ways that we can tackle this. And one of the most important things we can do when we want people to feel intrinsically motivated to engage in security is actually use more positive messaging. People are drawn to positive messaging. It provides a dopamine hit in their brain 
when they receive positive feedback that we simply don't get as humans when we receive negative feedback. And there's been a great deal of research to back this up. For example, researchers in New York hospitals were given the task of trying to increase compliance among doctors and nurses when it came to hand washing and hand sanitization. The researchers first tried to do this by using um, negative messaging. They put lots of signs up around hand sanitization stands saying, you know, you need to wash your hands, you need to sanitize your hands, um, lots of warning signs saying that they were monitoring the doctors and the nurses because there wasn't enough hand sanitization. And the researchers were really very confident that this would work, but it did not. So the researchers decided to try something novel, something different, and they put up electronic signs above the hand sanitization stands saying, um, whenever someone used them, saying great job, giving positive feedback, a thumbs up, a smiley face. Um, and they also had electronic signs in the staff areas, which kept track of which shift was engaging in hand sanitization the most. So they introduced an element of competition and gamification. And the researchers were really shocked to see that very quickly compliance with hand sanitization jumped to over 90%. They thought perhaps this was a fluke, so they replicated the experiment in many other hospitals and they got the same results. And this is because we as human beings are drawn to positive messages. Research by neuroscientists, particularly research led by Professor Tali Sharot and her team of neuroscientist researchers, has found that as individuals, we are biased towards being optimistic. 80% of people around the world, regardless of where we live, our backgrounds, our gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, most people feel optimistic about their individual lives. We may look at the world around us and think that things are getting worse, but we think that we as individuals will be absolutely fine. And we feel that way even in the face of statistics that suggest otherwise. So people will never think that they are the one who is going to get divorced, be ill, come into problems in their lives. That kind of thing that happens to other people. Me, I'm gonna be just fine. For example, this research team asked people, how likely they thought they were of developing cancer in their lives. And people said, on average, you know, maybe 10%. The research team then told the participants in the study, oh, actually all of us have a 30% chance of developing cancer in our lifetime. How likely do you think you now are of getting cancer? And people responded, well, you know, maybe 11%. People are very reluctant to take on board negative statistics or negative impressions about their own future. We're drawn towards positivity and optimism. And so when it comes to security, when we keep telling people negative messages and giving them statistics of how many hacks they've been, how much money it's costing, how many people it's impacting, people will think that's happening to everyone else. Why would hackers want my data? That's never gonna happen to them. That's gonna happen to everyone else. So what we need to do is rethink about how we shape our messaging. Because if we keep just telling people the negative messages, if we keep just trying to scare them, people find ways emotionally of avoiding taking that messaging on board. Instead, we need to recognize that actually if we make people feel optimistic about something, they are more likely to engage in our messaging. So if we can shift our messaging away from the negative and from saying it's not a case of if but when, if we can shift that and say, you know, we're recommending these three, five security behaviors, and if you engage in these, this will massively reduce the threat that you face when it comes to cybersecurity. If we can promote that kind of messaging, then actually it's way more effective at getting people to engage in the kind of behaviors we're recommending. And the more that we can do this, the more we can use this kind of positive messaging, the more likely we are to be building up social proof. So social proof is the psychological phenomenon that if we don't know what to do as individuals, we will copy other people. It's why websites like TripAdvisor, 
Amazon with the reviews, Google reviews are all so popular because as humans, if we don't know where to eat, where to shop, what book to buy, what film to watch, we will look at what's been good enough for everyone else. And if other people think it's okay for them, it's probably going to be okay for me. And this is challenging in security because a lot of our messaging actually drives negative social proof. For example, we will often tell people how bad passwords are. They're, every year there will be password lists published saying everybody's using terrible passwords. Look at how bad all of the top 10 passwords are. And while I understand why people put out this messaging, trying to raise awareness of the need for better security, what I fear that messaging does is actually say to people, everyone else is using a terrible password. So it's just fine if yours is terrible too. It's using social proof to shoot us in the foot. There are many ways that actually we can use social proof to our advantage. For example, lots of organizations now run phishing simulations. And if you're running a phishing simulation, then you can think about how you communicate the messaging from it. For example, many organizations will give comms out after a phishing simulation where they say, we've done a phishing simulation, 20% of people click the link, this is really terrible, do better next time. This is negative messaging and it's not taking advantage of an opportunity to use social proof. You can flip that kind of messaging on the head and instead say, we ran a phishing simulation, 80% of people did not click the link. That is fantastic. Next time, if you're in the 20%, join the 80% and help keep this organization safe. You can do better, go one step further. And instead of talking about click rates, because people will always click on a link, um, there's always gonna be a number of people that do that. Instead of talking about that, why don't you talk about the behavior you want? We ran a phishing simulation and X amount of people reported the fish. Next time, if you didn't report it, join your colleagues, keeping our organization safe. And if you suspect you receive a phishing email, report the fish. There you are building on social proof. You're using positive messaging. You're highlighting the behaviors that you want and it creates a much more empowering message that really draws on self-efficacy. So I hope you've enjoyed my presentation today. The messages that I really hope you take away from it is that if you're talking about a scary subject and cybersecurity inherently is scary, then you need to make sure you balance that with strong efficacy because people will have an emotional response to what you're saying and you want people to engage not in managing the emotion, which means that they will avoid any behaviors you're recommending. You want people to engage in the true danger and participate in the behaviors that you want them to. To help do that, it's important to reduce the noise so people can actually effectively engage with the signal. If we tell people 50 things that they need to do with cybersecurity, it's overwhelming and it's unrealistic. Instead, how can you prioritize the top core behaviors that you want people to change immediately, knowing that when they've done that, you can move on to the next set of behaviors, breaking this down into more bite-sized chunks. If you want people to change their behaviors, you have to give them a mechanism by which they can do that. So provide the tools. If we don't provide the tools for behavioral change, we can't expect people to change their behaviors. It's very simple. And finally, building engagement with positive messages that harness social proof and optimism. People are naturally optimistic about their lives. People naturally mimic the behaviors of others. So we should be using that messaging to make our own messaging much more effective. We are in a very advantageous position when it comes to cybersecurity. At our point in history, there is more knowledge about how people behave as they do, why people behave as they do, how the human brain responds to messages and what we can do to positively shift that behavior. We know more about this than ever before. There are many fields, psychology, sociology, communications, politics, so many fields that will help us understand actually human behavior and what motivates human behavior that we as a discipline can draw on to be much more effective.
I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and I hope it might encourage you to think a little bit more about how we can effectively engage with people so that they more effectively engage in cybersecurity. Hi everyone, my name is FC and welcome to my talk on how I rob banks and other such secure places. Uh, it is my pleasure to be talking today at Pluralsight Live 2020. So let's get started. Who am I? I'm the co-founder and co-CEO of Sygenta, a cybersecurity consultancy firm based in the UK. Uh, I'm the head of ethical hacking there and I've been in cybersecurity for 20 mumble years. Um, in that time, I've been a senior pen tester, uh, the head of social engineering and physical assessments for several companies, and I've also been the head of offensive cyber research for a massive defense firm. Before we get started, I want to caveat this talk. Um, we are a professional company that get contracted to help clients become more secure. Um, the way we do that is with contracts, we have permission to do everything that you're about to see in these talks. Um, I strongly suggest that you don't go and try these tools and techniques in order to get money unless you have permission from whoever it is you're, you're targeting. So just bear that in mind as we go through. Now, there are four ways to rob a bank. Two are physical and two are digital. The two ways to rob a bank digitally, you can attack the bank itself, which is what we're going to do during this talk. The end user, however, is the other way that you can attack a bank. End users aren't really educated in security. They don't understand the implications of posting their debit card details onto social media, for example. So for the rest of this talk, we're not really gonna focus on the end user themselves. We're gonna focus on the bank. How do you rob a bank digitally? Well, if you ask anyone, you'll probably get a list of skills such as this, the types of skills that you could possibly learn on Pluralsight or the types of skills that I have honed over the last 20 odd years. This is what people think you need in order to rob a bank digitally, to hack into a bank. Well, it's kind of right, but it's also kind of wrong. What you actually need is just a browser. With a browser, what you can do is just browse the bank, browse the website, browse what's around and have a look and you'll find stuff like this. This is a Joomla administration login page for a well-known commercial bank. With these types of things, you can just brute force your way in. This shouldn't be used to manage a bank's website. Banks also have to access email. So some banks implement webmail. It's probably not a good idea to be running that on your main bank website though. If you look around, you may even discover open index files, um, folders showing all of the files that are actually on the computer that is hosting it. You can actually even download these files and I can promise you there's always something way more important than log files that are being held online. So whenever I go around the world um, talking about hacking, uh, people always ask me that one specific question of, can you teach me how to hack? Well, that's what we're here for today. And I'm going to teach you how to hack a bank really quickly. Um, because we don't need all those skills. We just need a browser and a couple of things. So what are those things? The basics as it were. So how to hack the basics, find an input field, say a search bar, for example, and try a back tick in it or a single quote, or maybe even a piece of HTML code. If you know any. What you'll end up with is either the code will just run or you'll get an error message. Um, sometimes it'll actually handle it well and not show you anything. But for those of you that actually error, you'll get something like this. This is an SQL exception error. And what that means is there's a SQL injection flaw that you've discovered. And if you can do that, then you can do all sorts of very interesting things. One of the things that we like to do is put code onto a website that runs and is malicious and does something, right? It's very hard to show you that type of code though, because it's by its nature hidden. You don't see the actions of those things if you're the end user. So in order to show you this, what, what I've done is I've put together a couple of slides of real life banks that we've worked with that have allowed me to inject code onto their web page. Um, and what you end up with is stuff like this. So this is a picture that I have injected onto the page. It's part of the website and it's going to be there when you go to that page. Now you have to imagine that that pigeon is actually a piece of malicious code that is running in the background. 
We do this a lot with pigeons. Um, we probably have more pigeon pictures than we should have as a company. Um, but my favorite one that we ever did was this one, um, where you see the background image has now been changed to a uh, rather curious pigeon. So once you have managed to get code running or you've injected SQL commands into the page, you can actually start to use automated tools to make your life easier. One of these tools is SQL Map and it was written by a good friend of mine. Um, in this case, what we've done is we've found a SQL injection error. We've used SQL Map to pull out database contents by using these error messages. Um, we can extract out data. And in this case, we've actually extracted out credit card information from a website and it's probably taken us less than 15 minutes to do this. The next slide you're going to see is a photograph I took of an ATM showing my accounts after one of these style of attacks. And as you can see, it's very profitable to do this type of SQL injection. Um, we can get out all sorts of monetary things as well as data. So the next question everyone might be asking themselves is, well, that's great. You've taught me how to hack a bank digitally. That seemed fairly easy. Can you teach me how to rob a bank physically? So as I said before, there are two ways to physically rob a bank. Now you're probably all thinking of the first and easiest way, right? The, the big well-known method, which is to use a gun, right? So I can promise you, if you attempt to rob a bank nowadays with a gun, you will get arrested and probably shot or both. And I don't know which order that's going to happen in. So never use a gun to rob a bank. It is a terrible, terrible idea and it's not going to work. So how do you physically rob a bank? Well, these are the things you need. You need permission, preparation, confidence, cool gadgets sometimes, and the mindset. The mindset is the really the most important part of this. Um, if you have permission, you can do basically anything. And I want to show you the types of things that I deal with when I'm doing a physical assessment of a bank. So let's start with the perimeter. First of all, a quick quiz. Here is a perimeter of a building. Take a look at this perimeter and tell me some of the security issues that you can see. Well, some of the things that I see anyway is the fact that the front is made out of glass. No security is involved there because you can literally look through windows and that's how they're designed to work. So you can see through into this building and you can see that there's no security guard. There's no secretary even sitting at the desk. You could walk into this room knowing full well what you were going to expect because you can see it. You can walk straight over to the elevators, get into the building, get past reception. There's no security there. You can also see that there's no security cameras either. A good example of this is a building that I was working for um, in London. Um, I sat outside this building for about 20 minutes in order to get this photo. And the reason for that is you'll notice they've got a meeting room at the front of their office and it's built out of glass, which means everyone on the street can see what's happening inside. And what's happening is, or what was previously happening, was they were holding a meeting and projecting everything up onto that blank wall on the right hand side. So I could see all of the facts and figures and graphs and PowerPoint slides that they were going through. I obviously had to wait in order to take this photo so that they could stop their meeting, otherwise we'd be divulging private information. But the perimeter is also made out of fencing. This is one data center, where I'm not gonna tell you the location of, but it's a secure site. And in order to secure it, better they decided they needed lighting as well as a fence so around the external side of the fence they put these lights but the lights didn't actually make much difference what they've actually done there is given me a step up these are about three four feet high and i can just use those in order to gain access over the height of the fence also at the same site they had cctv coverage but the trouble is they didn't really think about it They've only covered in this image, you can see that they're only covering two directions. There's no camera facing to the left hand side. That's because there's a giant woods there as a small copse of trees. Um, they obviously think that hackers or attackers wouldn't be bothered to walk around the, the, the small bundle of trees and get over the fence down there. So they don't even bother checking it. Here's another quiz for you. This is the back of a high street bank in London. Um, I broke into this bank in order to gain access to their systems. Now, can anyone see any major security issues here? One of the things you might see is that the small door to the bottom right is a fire exit, but you can't really get in there it's without forcing your way in. There's a small door 
um, again, in the middle of the picture, down at the bottom, it's a black door with a, a small padlock. And as you know, one of my hobbies is picking locks, so that wasn't particularly too hard to get into. But the big security issue here is actually the security camera itself. It's not pointing at the door. It's not pointing at the access points of this bank. It's actually pointing at a tree, which is obviously very vital and important for the environment, but not very good if you're a bank. So then we get to ingress points. Ingress points are the points where you get in or out of a perimeter. Now, some clients understand how this works. Some clients don't. Um, very quick question. Does anyone spot any issues with this? Now, yes, it's very obvious that there's no fence on the left hand side. And some people would be like, well, that's how you're going to get in. But once that fence is built, this is a new system that they're putting in place. Once that fence is built, it's going to be fairly secure, except it's not. Because what they've done is they've used a system that has built in ladders. So if you're an attacker, you can just literally use the doors to climb over the fence itself. There's also no CCTV here, so no one's going to see you doing it anyway. We worked with a bank in Europe and we went into their building and we weren't there for a physical security test. But this is what we were faced with, a random turnstile in the middle of their reception. And I said to them, why have you got that there? What, what security does that offer you? And the response was, well, every now and again, we pull this rope barrier across and we force everyone to come in through the turnstile and we check who they are. It's totally at random. No one knows it's going to happen. They just come in through the door. They're faced with this. They have to go through it. So it's going to capture any criminals trying to get in. I'm like, okay, that's brilliant, right? Except it doesn't work like that. Because what you've done is you've built the front of your office out of glass, which means anyone approaching can see whether or not the rope barrier is up and therefore just walk away. So they spent a lot of money thinking about security without thinking about how it's implemented. This happens a lot with clients where they decide to install some security piece of equipment that was going to help their security without really taking into context where it's going to sit, how it's going to work and how it can be circumvented. And often the solution is to place a security guard there. This picture where we see me taking a photograph of said security guard. Now there's a bit of context to be had around this photo. Uh, this is in what's known as a dark site. A dark site is used by a bank to just store computers. Nobody works there. There's generally one, maybe two security guards and that's it. It's lights off. It's a dark site. So I had managed to infiltrate one of these dark sites. And as you can see, I'm behind the security desk with the security guard um, and I'm rifling through his bag. As you can see, he is looking at the CCTV cameras. He's not looking for attackers in this case. He's actually looking for the lunch van. The lunch van pulled up outside where you can see the blue car past the barriers and he puts on his coat. And despite the fact that I shouldn't be there and he should be very agitated by this, he decides to put his coat on and leave me in the reception area whilst he goes through the barriers to get his lunch. So he's standing outside and I'm hovering over the button saying, do I lock him out or <laughs> would that be wrong? So I didn't actually lock him out in this case. What I actually did was I ran off, broke into the data center and stole millions of pounds instead. A much more interesting day. So once you get inside of a building, you'll find all types of security controls that are probably not installed correctly or not used properly. So I'm sure pretty much all of you will at some point have seen one of these. Now, I can promise you, they only look like this on day one. What you'll tend to find is something that looks like this. Now, there is another security concern with this. Now, you could probably guess that the password is 1970, right? Because people like to use dates for these types of things because it's easy to remember. But the other security issue here is that it's actually secured using Phillips screws. You can just unscrew it, which is what I did in this case, unscrewed it, bypassed the, uh, the lock me mechanism and got the green light. So it's now open. Another type of lock that you may see is this. Now, this is a photograph that my wife took um, and you can see what they've done is they've written the code on the side of the door on the wall. Now, that was the correct code, but these people are security conscious and they know that that's a terrible thing to do. So what they've done is they've changed it regularly. And you can see just under the word code where they've rubbed out the old one when they changed it. So another thing that you'll find when you're walking through offices is magnetic locks. These are locks that are using 
electricity to produce a magnetic resistance to a door opening, right? These are very secure normally, um, except a lot of people put them in wrong. And this is a classic example of someone putting in a security feature, but not understanding how it actually works. In this case, both of these doors here show the lock on the outside where the attacker is gonna be, which means I could just unbolt it or even just unclip or cut the wires for the electricity and it's no longer a lock. My favorite variation of this though is this door here. And you can see it says this door is alarmed and well, it should be because this is the worst security door I've ever come across. So let's break it down. First of all, it's made out of glass, not smash proof glass, it's not bulletproof glass, it's just normal glass and criminals know how to use hammers and bricks. It's not hard to get through that. But it's also got a magnetic lock. Well, that's on the wrong side, so we don't really have to worry about that either. And then you think, well, it says it's got an alarm system, and it does, it's got an, a great alarm system, except the way that you turn the alarm off is using the key in the box at the top in the middle. And they've left the key in for you. So you don't even have to pick the lock, you just turn the key and the alarm goes off. But the worst part here is the fact that it's, got a, it's installed with a drop ceiling. So you don't even have to bypass the door, you can just literally lift the tiles up and then climb over. So another quick quiz for you, you're inside, you see a desk like this, this, this looks like pretty much any office that you go into. Um, and there are several security issues here, right? First of all, you can see that the desktop is unlocked and just left. So I have access to all of the emails, all of the network, anything I want to do, I can compromise this machine in seconds. Other things is there's loads of papers lying around. You can find all sorts of information on papers lying on people's desks. You can find interesting photographs of their family if you wanted to kidnap or blackmail a high net worth individual in a bank, for example. But the biggest issue, and one that most people don't notice on this slide, uh, is the chap in the top left. He is working opposite someone, and someone has come up to that desk who he doesn't know, shouldn't be there, isn't wearing a, any identification badge, and is taking photographs of his colleague's desk. And at no point did he even look at me, ask me what I was doing there, why I'm there, what I'm doing, taking photographs inside the office. He is the biggest security threat. And people need to be educated and, and the culture needs to change within an organization in order for it to be more, more secure. It doesn't matter if you've put in all of the firewalls, all of the network analytics, those things don't matter. It's the people in the company that can have the biggest impact. So another quick quiz for you. Um, this is outside a government building. I had maybe a few seconds to look at this, this, um, this area before I had to move on because of CCTV was in the area um, and I had to steal some stuff. Now it's fairly obvious to most people what I'm gonna steal from here and it's the shredding paper on the right hand side because people never shred stuff that's actually not important. They only shred the important things. So avoid all the stuff in the black bin bags because that's not important. Take the stuff on the right hand side because that is important and because i don't have many hobbies as i said before i actually just go back to my hotel and piece it all together it's very simple to do this it's a very therapeutic thing actually to do so highly recommend it but if you have vital information that you want to destroy i really suggest fire and when you're inside a building you can do all sorts of interesting things such as join meetings now that doesn't sound very interesting if you're an attacker um, but Believe me, you can get so much information if you're in a meeting. In this case, this was the CEO giving an all hands meeting to everyone in the company about how they hadn't had any security breaches that year. Um, I was standing in that meeting having been a security breach. So I really wanted him to ask, is there any questions so that I could say, who am I and what am I doing in your building? Another thing I've, I've done in the past is convince teams to build teepees out of their coats and some sticks. Um, I also built my own office once um, out of bits and pieces from other departments. So the computer came from one place, the table came from another, the chair came from another. So I wanna quickly wrap up with what you can do. So you can enable your staff and make security a priority in your company. Confront unknown people by offering them help, not being confrontational. So just asking who they're here to see and can you take them to them? 
And the most important thing is taking an attacker's eye view of your office and your clients. See if you can spot how an attacker would potentially get in. And seek advice. There are many companies, not just Sygenta, that, that can offer advice on, on these types of attacks. But the biggest thing you can do is understand that you're very unlikely to be targeted by a nation state. So what you can do, though, is lower your expectations. Setting the security bar too high can only lead to failure. I really suggest that you focus on the foundational parts of security. Educating people is the biggest thing that you can do. So thank you very much for your time today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Pluralsight Live. Hey there, my name is Richard Sirota. Welcome to this talk at Pluralsight Live, the right way to craft a multi-cloud strategy. I'm a Pluralsight author, as well as my day job at Google Cloud, where I'm in product management. Also work for InfoQ, do some blogging, do some tweeting. I appreciate you taking some time today to learn about multi-cloud with me. We'll talk about some of the technology, some of the techniques, some of the approaches, try to help you do this the right way. Look, humans like having choice. I myself, if I look around my house, I've chosen non-uniformity. For example, the device OSs, I'm running a MacBook. Kids in the house have Chromebooks. There's also a Windows machine here. We have different phones. We've purposely chosen some of this non-uniformity just for simple choice. And sometimes we don't even have a choice. My 401k goes into a bank account that's not where I usually do banking. So I've got different financial institutions in my life simply because that's been kind of foisted upon me. So I've had to deal with that. Even if I look at shopping options, I could go to the grocery store that's 10 minutes away. I usually go to the one that's 20. It's probably not the most convenient, but I like the value I get at the other one. So in many cases, throughout all of our lives, we have a lot of choice. And in some cases, we choose to make things more complicated on purpose a little bit, simply because we get different value. And that's kind of normal. Even in IT, we choose lots of different things, including multiple clouds. So recent surveys show almost 81% of uh, organizations have two or more major cloud providers. Like They're using Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, Oracle, Alibaba, other clouds, at the same time, that rate is growing. So the number of companies, these big companies, who have gone from single cloud to multi-cloud, shrinking single cloud, growing multi-cloud. So what's that all about? We're going to talk about that today, kind of look at what does it mean to be multi-cloud? When should you do it? When should you not do it? How can you do it the right way? Because look, doing this, a multi-cloud strategy, it's really easy to mess this up. Not because you're not smart people, but because this is complicated stuff. And sometimes we can over-engineer and make their bad decisions. But what we want is a good, effective cloud strategy that takes into account the different clouds, the different sort of needs we have, and helps us be successful with that. So we're gonna do three things. I'm gonna talk about some of the multi-cloud use cases. When does this actually make sense? We're gonna review some of the multi-cloud technologies that you might come across and how to choose them. And then we're gonna look at some of the do's and don'ts. How can you make sure you make great choices here and don't do some of the things that are gonna get you in trouble? First, Let's talk about some of the multi-cloud use cases. When does this actually make sense? I'll look at four different areas. First, there's this question of risk. As a large organization, you might say, I'm gonna choose where I'm gonna lock into certain levels. And look, everything's locked in. Your programming language is a lock in, your hardware provider, you're always locked into something. But you might wanna have certain choice about where you lock in and where you have some portability. So you might choose different clouds so that you have an option to put some workloads in another cloud if you wanna change that later or any number of reasons. Same with potentially disaster recovery. You might say, look, I have to stay in this country. And if this country's data center goes down with this cloud, I'd want the option to potentially stay online by also running the workload elsewhere. I have to be careful there, but there's real use cases for that. And there might even be regulatory reasons. Certain data can't leave certain regions or other reasons that you might choose a certain cloud. Same with special services. And we'll talk about this more later, but the clouds aren't all the same. They don't have the same services. They're not the same experiences. And so you might pick one cloud because they have great big data services. You could pick another one because you love their machine learning or their application integration technologies or their hybrid capabilities. That's fine. That's great. The clouds are awesome. They're not all the same. You might want to be able to mix and match because that's what we always do in technology, let alone our real lives. We don't single source everything. We're choosing the best things for the problems to solve. And then finally, again, almost like my bank scenario, sometimes you don't have a choice. So if I do mergers and acquisitions and I bring in another company that's using a cloud that I didn't use already, sometimes you try to pull them onto your choice of tech. Sometimes you just have to kind of smash these things together and, and work side by side. So in many cases, you're going to be multi-cloud whether you want to or not. 
simply because of how natural business operates. The final category and use case can be team autonomy. You might end up with different geographies, teams, projects, partners that bring in their own cloud preferences. It's okay. You might want to make sure that you have that flexibility again to cater to that. You might have all kinds of reasons here spanning from risk to team autonomy to acquisitions. There's a number of reasons why you could choose to use multiple clouds on purpose. Now let's talk about the technologies. Because again, this isn't always easy. How do you choose technologies that are just sitting in one cloud? Now, of course, look, let's be clear. The innovation outside of any cloud will always be greater than innovation just in one cloud. Makes sense, right? The whole ecosystem of open source, commercial vendors, that's a big pool of vendors. So no one cloud will ever match that innovation. It's nice to choose best of breed at some times. But if I look at the stack, we'll talk about these here. I might have platforms, provisioning tools, management tools, deployment tools, different data and application services, and then some developer things. Let's talk about each one of these and I'll show you some examples. Platforms. How do I run potentially my workloads kind of uniformly across different clouds? There's a whole vendor space here. Of course, where I am at Google Cloud, we have Anthos. Anthos normalizes the compute using Kubernetes to say, I want to kind of have the same operations on the public clouds, private clouds, edge, whatever. I can get similar things conceptually from VMware and Red Hat and Rancher and Mirantis. So these are platforms that typically sit on top of clouds and normalize some of the compute network and storage. If I move up a level to provisioning, you might say, I don't even care about the platform stuff, but I don't want to lock into provisioning tools. Maybe you don't want to only use AWS CloudFormation or Azure Resource Manager. You want to have some more control and portability at that layer. Cool. You might choose something like Terraform from HashiCorp. You might use something where you can actually write code with something like Pulumi. You might use Kubernetes as a provisioning engine to provision services in different clouds. If you're using Cloud Foundry, you might use Bosch. So this provisioning layer, again, you're choosing which layer you might be willing to lock into that cloud or that technology set and other layers where you're buying portability. Look at management. Again, Anthos is also a management control plane. It manages its clusters and infrastructure in different places. Could also use Rancher, Tanzu Mission Control from VMware, upcoming Azure Arc, or even if you look at API tools. I might use Apigee and manage my APIs in different clouds or Kong or Ambassador. I might do management and monitoring and logging in Splunk or Datadog or Honeycomb for troubleshooting as well. So I might not want to use just what's proprietary in that cloud. I might want to have portability in my management stack, my API stack, my monitoring stack, and then I can run the same thing in all the clouds. Look at deployment. How do I actually ship code? How do I ship the value that my company actually depends on? I might use something like JFrog's Artifactory to actually store containers or store packages or store some of the, my deployment artifacts or GitHub's new container registry. Or I might be using GitLab or Jenkins or other tools on different clouds just to ship my code to production. I might use Spinnaker for continuous delivery because that can ship code to every single cloud. So again, these deployment tools also might be handy to have things that aren't just AWS code deploy or Google Cloud build, you might choose to have tools that will work across any cloud environment. Look at the data and app services. Any software you build needs them, right? My apps need data. And I might use the, the native data services in a given cloud. I might want to use Google Cloud Spanner or Azure Cosmos DB. That's great. You might also choose to use things that are portable. Confluence, Kafka technology, sure. Redis Enterprise is a Redis choice. I might be using the data stacks tool for Cassandra everywhere, or it might be using an identity as a service provider like Auth0 or Okta. Again, these are choices of where do I want to have some consistency and have it behave the same on every cloud. Let's talk about the dev tools. I'm a developer. I'm cranking out code. I don't want to necessarily use something that only works in one deployment target. I might use Visual Studio Code. I might use IntelliJ for Java apps and other things. I might use Docker as a tool to work consistently in clouds. And as part of my development pipeline, I might be storing issues in Jira Cloud or using Trello or using Postman to test APIs. Lots of different tools that don't necessarily force me to use one cloud. And then dev frameworks. Of course, I get language-specific SDKs for every cloud and potentially can mix and match. Or you're using languages and frameworks that are actually multi-cloud friendly, like Spring Boot, that says, if I'm using one database from this vendor and one database from this cloud, I can kind of swap them relatively easily because there's enough abstraction where I can keep it separated from my code, so that works well. Or the serverless framework that deploys functions to every different type of cloud with an abstraction layer. 
So lots of different tools, even for developers, any part of this stack, you could say, I don't wanna use this, I do wanna use that. All of this stuff is pluggable. You're choosing which layers you want portability for. I hope that makes sense. Now I wanna to go to the final section, which is some of the do's and don'ts. There's things to be careful of here. There's things that you can make poor choices and places you can make awesome choices. So let's talk about a few things to, to think about. First, do. Standardize on a few foundational components. What are the fundamentals? What are the things that you wanna be consistent on every cloud. Let's talk about this. So what is fixed? What do I want to make sure it behaves the same on all of my clouds, public, private, all those sorts of things. And then where do I want choice? Choice is good. We've talked about that. I don't want to force my teams to have one fixed stack in every environment. I'm probably going to limit their creativity. So I have to choose where can I have flexibility? Where do I want to enforce a standard? So things like identity management, probably a standard. I don't think I would just want to use different identity in every cloud, different roles, different permissions, different certificates, all those sorts of things. I probably want to have one identity store and then replicate those sort of roles elsewhere, have a consistency there. Maybe even infrastructure provisioning. I may want to have one way I provision infrastructure regardless of the cloud so that my skill set's portable. Now for flexibility, I could choose to say programming language. Look, I'm not going to be too fixed on that. You want to use Java here? You want to do Node here, Python here? I'll be okay with that. Maybe in some places, even the CI CD platform, you give some flexibility team by team. Again, you have to figure out how much lock-in do you want to different tools? Where do you care about portability? Same with databases. If it's something really boring, like a relational database, you might say, look, I don't care which cloud you use, but it has to be MySQL. Probably a good idea versus this cloud's MySQL, this one's SQL Server, this one's Oracle you probably should standardize on boring things. And of course, a product plug for Anthos. I think Anthos is pretty nice here. You're actually standardizing the compute network storage in your platform on any cloud using things like GKE on AWS or on-premises or in GCP. Pretty nice stuff and being able to manage that. But look, I don't care what you pick. Pick something that's going to help you standardize that fundamental layer. What's the first don't? So don't assume apps are actually portable between clouds. This is one that, again, you can kind of fall victim to. So be careful of what you actually think is portable. Containers are portable. Code is portable. But rarely are the dependencies. So if we think about the compute portion, sure, right? The business logic, that same code can obviously literally run elsewhere. VMs can move between clouds. That's fine. What about the data? What about the networking? What about the other configuration settings? Not as portable. So when I think about this, the portable things that are hard are those environmental settings, right? What are all the permissions for who can do what? Which firewall ports are open? That's the stuff that doesn't always move very easily. So you can accidentally over-engineer by actually trying to make these apps that can run the same everywhere. That's not really the thing, right? I can't right-click an app and say, you go run in this cloud. Now let's slip you back here. That doesn't really work that way. So if what I care about, when I think about portability, I think the best thing is to have portable architecture skills portable programming frameworks, maybe even infrastructure APIs. Aim for those things that are going to be important to be portable, but trying to make your app portable is a really tough thing to do and probably not worth it. The next do. So identify the most proprietary services in any given cloud. Put out the list, understand what those are. So let's name them, right? Compute isn't that proprietary among the clouds. Everybody's running VMs. Everybody's got a batch service or a functions platform or container runtime, some sort of PaaS platform. It's not that different, right? You can probably survive with moving things around there without too much work. Databases, again, pretty similar. Yep, Google Cloud has things like Spanner and Bigtable, which are awesome. You've got things like Cosmos and others in, in Azure. Of course, you've got Aurora serverless and things in AWS. But for the most part, swapping databases isn't rocket science, even messaging. Right, SQS and Amazon or PubSub and GCP, fundamentally they're queues. It's not that hard to switch those things. So these aren't super sticky. Now, what is sticky? Things like identity systems, right? The artificial intelligence components, the things that actually build and deploy code, some of the monitoring things, some of the networking configuration, load balancer, VPNs, all the security services, those get very intertangled into your applications, into those services. It's really hard to extract yourself from that stuff later. So it might be fine, but just understand which ones those are. And for some of those, you might say, look, I don't really care about the key management service in each cloud. I'm just going to bring in HashiCorp's Vault, and I'm going to use Vault on every cloud because that's the most multi-cloud solution, and I can learn one thing. 
that might make sense to you. In other places, you like that stickiness, and that's fine. But I encourage you to name those. Understand what you're getting into in a given cloud. Now, the counterpoint is don't skip out on the unique value of each cloud. Now, you might think I'm saying two different things. First, I'm telling you to name the sticky services. Now, I'm telling you to use the sticky services. Yes, because at the same time, you have to be careful here. Cloud is not just somebody else's data center, right? Clouds have differentiated value. They're hopefully helping you deliver value faster to your customers. And when you do these lowest common denominator strategies where, hey, we're not going to use anything in this cloud that's lock-in, that's tough. And you're not getting the value and you're probably just wasting a lot of time. So you have to be careful there. There's certain services that are fine to, to lock into. You're getting value from it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. So avoid that lowest common denominator where you purposely stay away from all the unique stuff. That unique stuff's where the value is. Now, again, look for the emerging areas that are worth investing deeply into. Things like IoT, analytics, AI. Those are unique services. Lock into those. You're going to get value from them. Those are great. Now, I think what's important to me, something I learned from a, a friend of mine years ago, was you also have to think about that the stack of an application is going to change over time. When I'm doing an MVP, when I'm experimenting, when I'm trying to figure out if this is even a problem to be solved, I don't want to spend three weeks debating my logging platform or which database to use. Just pick the most proprietary thing you can that helps you go the fastest. I don't care about lock-in at that point. I don't even know if I have a product. Who cares if I'm locked into it? So when I'm experimenting early on in the product, I'm probably using whatever is quickest. Now, a year in, two years, three years, potentially at that point, I'm, I'm stepping back going, hey, maybe I don't need this proprietary NoSQL thing. I'll, I'll drop it down to Mongo because now I'm getting more into maintenance mode, potentially, right? I'm going to go for maybe more cheaper or maybe I'm even going to be more portable because I'm going to take that app and run it in a cheaper place. Apps have a lifespan, right? It might be 10, 15 years in the enterprise. The tech you start with may not be the tech you end with, and that's totally fine. So up front, you're probably embracing differentiated services over time, probably winding back to commodities. What's the next do? Well, the next do is let your compute follow your data. I like a statement that the folks at Gartner Research said. Nowadays, it's not about data centers. It's about centers of data. Where are you generating information, data? Is it in your... Office 365 SharePoint account? Is it ad data that you're processing in Google Cloud? Is it data you're generating at the edge or in IoT devices or something in your on-prem ERP system? You've got data all over the place. I don't know how realistic it is that you're always going to smash it all together. And so moving it all to the same place, the same data lake, data warehouse, over time may be more costly as data transfer costs. Sometimes it's actually data you just want to filter at the edge before you process it. So Increasingly, instead of just kind of consolidating all the data and assuming you're just going to run your compute there, you're actually going to be looking at how do I deploy compute processing power to where my data is, right? Where is my data at rest? Where is it generated? How can I process the data there? This may pull you into multiple clouds. Your data is being generated in this cloud, stored in this cloud. You have an app in this cloud. Maybe you want to have compute at those places as well. This is, again, where something like Anthos is nice. I can run the same compute stack in every place where I generate data, whatever you use, it's just the same idea. This may drag you into multiple clouds, whether you like it or not, because you start to think about how can I process the data where it rests or where it generates. The next don't. Don't do a multi-cloud app architecture unless it's truly needed. So let's talk about what I mean by that. So I say beware of Franken apps. What I mean here is there's very few cases, I can't think of any off the top of my head, where you should be actually intermixing the cloud services for a single app. By that, I mean, I wouldn't have the network ingress load balancer in Google, the web function, my app running in Azure, and my database in AWS. That seems silly, right? My performance would be bad. My management would be tough. I'd have no single view of what's going on. Very few cases I could come up with. Now, of course, your app may be sitting in AWS or GCP and using Cloudflare for CDN. You might be using Twilio for doing telecommunication sort of stuff, that makes total sense. But there's very few cases where I should be taking services in different clouds and smashing them together if I don't have to, right? The point should be I should be trying to keep my stack close together for performance and manageability reasons. Same with, I don't think multi-cloud is a good scenario where I take the same app and run it in two different clouds for DR purposes, for some sort of resilience. That's really hard, right? Your first take should be, how do I take that one app and run it resiliently in that cloud? For some reason, you've mastered that, 
then maybe you add another place. Data replication costs are expensive. The networking is complicated. So be very careful, again, about that portability goal, but how you think about multi-cloud architectures. Instead, honestly, to me, multi-cloud is about the right cloud for the right workload. That's it. With very few things that should be shared between clouds, very few connections between clouds. Instead, I just like having at my disposal the right, the right sort of technologies and the right clouds, and I can pick the right one. So related to that, the next do, shape cloud computing to your needs. Right? I can argue that the first era of cloud, there's almost this feeling like, okay, I've got to go all in with one cloud. I've got to retrain my staff. I've got to change all my processes. And that's true to some extent on the, the philosophy of cloud. But now more and more, I think we're seeing that cloud should also kind of bend to you, not you to the cloud, right? How's that cloud serving you? How are you not shaping yourself to everything the cloud makes you do? This is a tool. This is something that's at your disposal. The only value you're, you really care about should be is your people, the software that you're interacting with your customers with, your people, right? So how do you look at the cloud as a tool versus necessarily forcing you to change everything about how you operate? This is where multi-cloud, again, is interesting because you start to say, well, which cloud's right for me? Which cloud's right for this app? Which service is right for this app? It starts to free you up versus feeling like you're a hostage of a single cloud environment. Now, don't start off multi-cloud. So what do I mean here? Well, learn the fundamentals of one cloud first. As I said earlier, cloud is not just someone else's data center. These are unique platforms. They do unique things. It's exciting. It's awesome. They're not all the same. So if day one of my cloud strategy is we're going to go use five clouds, you're in for a tough time. Instead, you do have to think about some of those kind of universal skills, right? CI, CD, continuous delivery, horizontal scale, managed services, modern networking. These are the important things you're going to want to learn. Now, when you start off with cloud, you don't want to overcomplicate it. You want to figure this out. You want to learn how to do these core things. And then as your situation matures, as your skills mature, as your needs mature, you're trying to do more complicated things. Then all of a sudden, yeah, let's start embracing services from different clouds and build the right app, right? Let's put the right app in the right cloud, but don't start off that way. That's going to be complicated. It's going to be tough. Instead, learn a cloud and then potentially expand your horizons. The final do, invest in continuous learning, keep the focus on the customer, right? What matters here? What matters here is not your cloud choice, which is weird from a guy who works at the cloud. But honestly, the only thing that really matters is that your customers love using the tech you're creating and they stay your customer, right? That's all that matters. I don't think any of your customers care which cloud you use. Well, except for a few for maybe regulatory reasons. But for most, it's an implementation choice. So when you think about your goals of cloud, multi-cloud, what have you, your goals isn't how many servers did I migrate? How many employees did I train or onboard? That's a vanity metric that only matters to IT. The actual goals that matter are going to be outcome-oriented things. Did I ship value faster? Is my system more stable? Can I you know, guarantee the security of my customers and my users? Am I able to lower costs? Like These are the business differentiating metrics that actually matter as I'm using cloud, as I'm even thinking of multi-cloud. Now, of course, continuous learning is important, though. Look, this industry is changing all the time. New services, upgraded features, new plans, new all sorts of things. And so you want to have an actual discrete learning plan for how do you stay up to date? And of course, you might not be hands on keyboard every day and different things. It's fine. But maybe you do block off four hours a month, eight hours a month, where you're using the latest things. You're taking training courses. You're keeping relevant. Because if you're thinking of doing something like multi-cloud, you want up to date information. What is the right way to do it? What are the right technologies? What are the things in each cloud that are unique? That changes somewhat often. So you want to be continuously learning in this cloud environment. And I think that's awesome. That's the fun part of this. So I would argue then that what we want to do is make cloud multi-cloud advantageous, not just tolerable. Right? I don't want to just have to suffer through multi-cloud because it's been foisted on me by my partners and my customers. I want to make it something where I'm actually getting advantage here. So three ways you can do it. You're going to choose per cloud lock-in where it makes sense, right? Lock-in. Lock-in can be awesome, right? If you're getting value from it, then use it. That's great. You just figure out how you can reduce your switching costs later if it matters. So figure out where that is, though, because you might say, hey, relational database, maybe I don't want to lock into that. That's commodity. But I do want to lock into maybe an awesome serverless product because that's actually helping me ship software so much faster. So let's do that. You know, secondly, really put a, a crisp focus on the simplest solutions you can, right? Let's avoid over-engineering. Don't kind of 
worry too much about portability or kind of cross-cloud resilience. It's really hard to accomplish. It's probably going to be more work than the value is. Focus on simplicity. Focus on manageability. That's what matters the most. And then finally, figure out the technologies that help you standardize the undifferentiated portion of cloud. This is why I work at Google, because I think Anthos is something special. I think this idea of trying to standardize on one layer so that I can innovate on the other layers is a powerful concept, especially as we start looking at compute that runs all over the place. So you can continue the multi-cloud journey with Pluralsight. There's a, a learning plan that we have here. The Hybrid Cloud Infrastructure Foundations with Anthos includes a number of courses. There's also 100-something you know, Google Cloud courses in Pluralsight. So it's something where you can continuously learn on this cloud and learn how to integrate with other clouds. I think that's pretty exciting. I appreciate you watching this course with me. I look forward to hopefully hanging out with you all in person at the next one versus this way, but hopefully this wasn't too bad. If you have feedback on the session, harass me on Twitter at, at rsorota. We'd love to chat with you. And thank you very much. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Julia Silgi, and I'm a data scientist and software engineer at our studio. And I'm really excited to um, be here at Pluralsight Live this year, um, speaking about data visualization for um, real world machine learning practitioners. Data visualization is such an important part of the machine learning um, process in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, here at Pluralsight Live this year, you're gonna have the opportunity to hear a lot about a different parts of the machine learning process and a lot about data visualization and how it's used in a lot of ways. And a lot of the time when we talk about data visualization, we talk about it as a, um, uh, about one of the key communication tools we have when we're speaking outward, um, when we're communicating about results, but um, also uh, uh, plotting, graphing, data visualization um, is, a, is, is something else as well. This is what um, I'm going to be talking about here in my talk. It's a tool that we can use to make better modeling choices. <clears throat> and it is a tool of the system designers and operators themselves. Um, it, uh, um, these plots and graphs and um, charts are um, are hugely important tools for everyone who deals with data, not just people who um, build models and machine learning systems. Um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about it, uh, today is true because data visualization is so effective at um, at surfacing information to human beings. When it comes uh, to data, these visual ways of perceiving information form how we think about um, the work that we're doing, how we understand the problems that we're solving and um, the models that we're building, and how we decide. And I especially want to focus on data visualization as a tool and um, an aid for decision making because building um, models and machine learning systems is a complicated and involved task. And the purpose of making plots and graphs um, is so that we as machine learning practitioners are more effective. In the context of modeling, more effective can have a couple of different meanings. Um, uh, it can mean more accurate, more accurate models. It can mean more um, uh, practically appropriate models. It can even mean more fair models. And today in this talk, we're going to talk, um, we're going to explore um, all of these. So I work on an open source framework for modeling and machine learning in R called um, Tidy Models. And a lot of the examples that I'm going to be showing today use Tidy Models uh, code. Some of the specific goals of the Tidy Models project are to uh, provide a consistent and flexible framework 
for real world modeling practitioners from those just starting out with modeling to um, to very experienced uh, machine learning practitioners also to harmonize uh, the heterogeneous interfaces that we have within R and to encourage good statistical practices through um, the design of how tidy models work and um, choices of defaults and um, uh, uh, how we build both the code, our code, our documentation, our supporting materials. And I'm, I'm really glad today here to get to um, show a little bit of what I'm building and what I work on. But um, pretty much everything that we're talking about here today is not specific to tidy models and it's not specific to R um, either. It is, is more general and more big picture. And in fact, um, what, what we're talking about here is just in general um, how data visualization practices um, are used by real world folks um, engaged in, um, in model building. Well, let's start by asking this question. When do practitioners build data visualizations? Asking this kind of question requires us to think about the process of model building itself and to build a mental model of model building, if you will. I'd like to put this out there as a schematic of what might happen during a typical process of a model practitioner getting from the point of seeing some data for the very first time to uh, having a working model. The model process starts with exploratory data analysis. This is this systematic, iterative process of exploring data to investigate it. After this comes feature engineering. This is this this is this task of um, taking the original variables that we have and transforming them in some way to having new features um, that have a that have a different form or fa format that are going to be more useful uh, as the input to a to a model. After this comes model fitting and tuning. I've represented this here as a lot of really skinny lines to emphasize that um, uh, uh, w when we're embracing best practices, uh, this kind of model fitting and tuning uh, typically involves resampled data sets. So we, we fit and tune and fit and tune and fit and tune. And typically during this process, we, we're not just trying out one model, we're trying out more than one model. We have multiple models that we want to try out uh, to see which one is going to perform best for the data set that we have. This isn't typically something that we can know ahead of time. This is something that we have to find out empirically from the data that we have. After we have fit and tuned our, um, our models on our data, we are then at the model evaluation step where we're measuring how well the models we've trained perform using um, some metrics that are appropriate to the specific kind of models that we train and the data that we have, the problem that we're solving. Notice that the, the process isn't over at this point because this, this whole thing is an iterative process. Do notice that at the very end, we're, we're heading towards some goal or some output either communicating the results to people or um, deploying the model to some kind of production system. I represented this here with a somewhat skin, like skinny or a thin bar, <laughs> but um, really picture that as transitioning to a whole other set of tasks invo involving a whole other set of skills. So in this talk, we're, <clears throat> we're gonna keep the scope on everything before that, on this um, iterative process of building uh, the model itself. We, we're not done once we get to that first stage of model evaluation typically. Typically then it's time to um, do some more uh, EDA because uh, some questions have arisen. It is time to uh, spend some more time in feature engineering because what we learned um, when we got to the end of those training those first models um, is that oh we need to change or do additional um, uh, work in building those kinds of features and then maybe we'll come back to those you know the models that performed best when we um, when we did that first that first set of model uh, a model fitting and tuning we'll fit them again after we incorporate this new uh, information this new knowledge that we've gained and then finally we'll evaluate again and and then move on to the output that we have so machine learning practitioners can of course um, make plots 
at any point during this process. But I want to make the argument that there are two phases during this, this whole model building process where um, practitioners use data visualization the most. The first of these is exploratory data analysis. Um, I said before that EDA is this process, this you know iterative process of um, investigation, um, question generation and refinement, and um, exploring. So this is a phase that p some people might um, uh, say is outside the process of model building, but we're going to see how uh, the investigations and the understanding gained during EDA um, have a huge impact on, on models and what they're like. The second phase where people build a lot of plots is model evaluation. This is the part of the modeling process where a practitioner has trained um, probably more than one model and is um, assessing, measuring, um, and probably comparing how well they have performed. So if you were able to come and like look over the shoulder of someone uh, building a model, these are the two points at which you would see them making the most plots. And um, uh, it, in my opinion, using visualization a lot um, during these two phases is a sign of a healthy model building process. The reason why is because these two points of the model building process are the points of the most important human decisions. Um, these are decisions where validation of them can be difficult. Often we, you know, we might say like, oh, there's you know, art, not science involved because, because they're full of trade-offs. The practitioner, as they go through their workflow, is having to weigh different priorities and make trade-offs at these, at largely at these two points during the process. And data visualizations are used as an aid and support to make those decisions and to carry out that task more effectively. So let's dig deeper into these two phases and learn a little bit more. Let's start with um, EDA, Exploratory Data Analysis, and let's ask the question, um, why are these plots built? At a very high level, these plots are built to understand the data. When a practitioner starts out on a modeling um, project, this is one of the first substantive um, tasks being faced. And the reason we as practitioners <clears throat> need to have this understanding of the data is because there's a about to be a whole bunch of decisions that need to be made. These data visualizations made during EDA um, let practitioners ask and then refine specific questions related to the modeling tasks. So th these are things like what, um, what kind of models are appropriate? This feeds then into the feature engineering phase that we talked about before and um, what kind of pre-processing tasks are needed. So all these kinds of questions are ones that uh, machine learning practitioners ask and refine and answer by making plots during the EDA process. Um, let's, let's look at what some of these plots actually look, li look like. Um, some of these plots take the form of um, very familiar statistical graphics, like this scatter plot. This plot uses a data set called the Palmer Penguins. Um, it's a data set of penguins observed in Antarctica near Palmer Station, and it maps each observation to a point on the plot with um, aesthetics like um, positions, X and Y, um, size, and color, representing things that have been measured about these penguins. So exploratory graphics like this are um, important for machine learning practitioners because, um, well, uh, like for starters, uh, they help us understand the type and amount of data that we have available. And then going further, they visually highlight the relationships in the data that we can use um, in feature engineering and then in building models. 
So if we want to um, build a classification model to uh, predict the species of the penguins or maybe the sex of the penguins based on the other measurements that we have of them, um, the relationships that we discover or highlight in a plot like this um, inform the steps that we make moving forward. Plots for EDA don't always look like the super classic statistical graphics like that one. So this one in some ways is also just a scatter plot, but um, what it's showing is a different kind of mapping. Um, it, it is a map. Um, so it's, what it's showing is a data set of trees in San Francisco. And that, that big empty area is Golden Gate Park. And some of those smaller empty areas are other parks. So immediately we know something about this data set of trees. The trees in the parks are not included in the data set. The color is mapped to who maintains the tree, each tree. Um, is it the Department of Public Works or um, is it someone else? So if our goal, you know, might be to um, train a model to predict who maintains uh, each tree, a plot like this has so much information for the person training the model. Um, in terms of uh, what kind of model might we want to try, uh, what predictors might we expect to be important, and um, you know, what, what are we learning about the data set overall just from using visualization as a tool in the process here. So machine learning practitioners uh, use visualization during exploratory data analysis to make uh, many, many different kinds of plots. So it's important that the tools that we use during this phase facilitate fluent iteration uh, through lots and lots of different kinds of graphs. Um, in my personal experience with uh, decades of experience with um, uh, various kinds of scientific plotting tools, I think that learning about and internalizing uh, the, the idea of the grammar of graphics is a huge step in this kind of efficient iteration. Uh, and that adopting a system that implements this grammar or applies this grammar takes you a huge step forward in this kind of efficiency. So where you, you, then, under, you then have uh, this toolkit of a grammar where you can build any kind of plot you need to with the pieces of the grammar in, the, in much the way that you could build a sentence in a language with the pieces of the grammar of the language. And it, it, you know, it p gives us this toolkit that um, allows us to be successful in this task of asking, refining, and answering questions to get ready to train models. So ggplot2 is one of the um, uh, you know, best known and most used systems that um, implements this grammar of graphics. And almost all the plots I'm showing in this uh, talk are plots that I made myself um, using uh, ggplot2. One of the first questions that has to be answered is what kind of model to use. So if we, you know, if we have some data set, the, the, the uh, most basic start thing we might start with in terms of a model might be um, linear regression using ordinary least squares. And in tidy models, one of our goals is to harmonize um, the heterogeneous interfaces that we often find in um, you know, the wild west of the modeling world in R. So we separate out the, um, the kind of model that we want to train, which um, is linear regression here, with the computational engine we want to use, which here would be um, LM from the stats, uh, uh, the stats package in R, which is ordinary um, least squares. So let's uh, imagine that during EDA, um, we discover that there's there's a ton, uh, just a ton of predictors, just just like so many, and and we I suspect or are pretty sure that we may run into problems with overfitting because our you know like how many predictors we have, say compared to how many observations we have, looks like it's going to be a problem. So we can, one of the models we can try then is a regularized model, and we can we can use the fact that we learned this during EDA that there are many predictors to decide to try a regularized model, and in tidy models you can fluently switch um, uh, between these computational engines, like what is going to do 
the fitting of the linear regression in this way with the idea of an engine. For some other modeling problem, we might see during EDA that there is a lot of complex interaction between variables and then realize, you know what? A linear model is not gonna work. I need something that can handle a lot of complex interaction. Tree-based models like random forests are good at learning these kinds of interactions between variables. That, that example of the trees in San Francisco is an example of when I might do this. Um, there were more variables in that data set than just the spatial information I showed in that plot. But um, even just from that initial map, you could see that there were complex relationships in latitude and lo longitude that were related to the outcome. And if you remember, the outcome was, um, was not continuous, but actually a label or a categorical variable. So we need to build a classification model rather than a regression model. And again, in tidy models, this is something that we can fluently um, switch with a consistent syntax so that we don't have to um, uh, change when we're dealing with other kinds of models. Um, so this might be just the most basic thing that we can start with, but even this is something that model practitioners learn from EDA, often through visualization. What kind of model is appropriate? A next step after this is feature engineering. And investigations during EDA also inform decisions about feature engineering. In tidy models, we capture data preprocessing and feature engineering in the concept of a preprocessing recipe that has steps, as outlined in this lovely illustration. So you, um, you decide what variables you're going to use and then define steps and prepare them using some training data. And then after that, you can apply them to any data set like testing data or new data. So protecting against um, data leakage during data preprocessing is a real defining feature of the design of tidy models. But the, um, the specific um, feature engineering steps that, uh, that you take here are typically chosen because of what we learn during EDA often using visualization. So let's look, look at another example data set. This is a data set of houses in Ames, Iowa. Uh, and we have a lot of information about these house characteristics, like um, how big they are, uh, where they are located, and their last selling price. This plot shows the sale price on the y-axis and um, latitude on the x-axis. So there's a big hole there where Iowa State University is in the town. And then there's some unique and um, complex structure in the price as you move across the city. We have, you know, a lot of options in terms of like how, how might we choose to model that complex structure. Um, but one option we might use is to um, build new features for modeling using spline terms. The thing is though, we have to choose how many spline terms to use. So two here doesn't look like it captures the real structure very well to me. Five looks better. Um, I would believe 10, 10 looks nice. 20 seems okay, but I'm starting to feel a little skeptical. Um, at 50, I no longer believe this. And at 100, this is just silly. So what's great about data visualization during the process of EDA is that we as machine learning practitioners can see and absorb this and use it to make decisions. Those decisions are then captured in code that we run. If you use tidy models, that code may end up, those decisions, you know, may end up looking something like this with a feature engineering recipe that is defined with steps that transform and prepare our data to get it ready for modeling, whether that's dealing with the factor levels that we have or creating indicator variables or setting those 10 spline terms like that last line does there. So whether it's engineering new features, choosing an appropriate model, or understanding data quality, 
Data visualization during EDA has a huge impact on what model practitioners do later on. In a lot of ways, it's a foundation on which the whole rest of the modeling process is built. Um, it is often possible to estimate the best parameter or answer or um, value or option for some of these choices that we've talked about. Um, for example, you could tune the, um, num like the number of spline terms, but it is nearly impossible to remove entirely the element of human judgment from these choices. Or at least it's a bad idea. Machine learning algorithms are astounding. They are incredibly capable of um, learning patterns from large amounts of data. Um, vigorous adoption of um, EDA and visualization as part of the machine learning process is one of the safeguards that we have against ending up in a situation um, where you have to ask yourself if it was a good idea to have to just um, uh, deep fry your data. So let's move on now and talk about that second stage, model evaluation. This is a phase where we have trained and probably tuned our models, so we have predictions to, that we can use to compare to true values, and we can assess how our models are performing. So let's again ask this question, um, why are these plots built? Um, at, at a very high level, the answer is um, to understand the models. So this is the point at which we as model practitioners have to reckon with questions about success and failure. Um, did this model work? Um, also, uh, machine learning practitioners often need or want to try out um, several different kinds of models. And model evaluation is when we compare models and ask uh, which model performed best. The process of model evaluation also allows us to interrogate subgroups, which is typically where discussions of model uh, fairness come in. A lot of the current work on machine learning bias and fairness focuses on how models perform differently for different groups, um, maybe for different um, uh, legally protected classes that may not have um, been included directly in the model, but um, but it you know it's possible that at the end of the model and the output, it's t it's possible to still see differences uh, because um, the, the some of the input variables uh, uh, are are you know like are, uh, are are related to those legally protected classes. Model evaluation is also concerned with understanding why a model is making the predictions it does. So for all of these questions, practitioners heavily use data visualization for a lot of the same reasons that it's used during EDA, which are, to be honest, largely the same reasons that anyone ever uses data visualization. These plots are used to ask and answer questions um, and to show relationships clearly that are difficult to see otherwise, and they are supports and aids for making decisions that need to be made. At the same time, there are some pretty unique things to note about plots used for model evaluation that I think are pretty interesting. One is that many of these plots involve um, graphical norms or idioms. So this plot shows how two model evaluation metrics for a lasso uh, regression model uh, change with the regularization penalty, like how regularized the model it is. So there's RMSC and R squared. So someone who is um, familiar with these kind of models can look at this plot and can quickly assess, uh, uh, did this model work? Uh, is this a model that required a lot of regularization or just a little bit? And, um, you know, looking at the R squared maybe, um, is this a model that fit the data well? or in this case, not so well. Um, so this, this plot is like a shorthand or idiom that packs a lot of information into it for a familiar audience. 
This plot is similar. Uh, this is a receiver operator characteristic curve or ROC curve. Uh, it's, it's 10 of them actually, for a model train on the Palmer Penguin data that we looked, um, we discussed at the beginning. And this kind of plot is a visualization of how well a binary classification model is doing. So the more up in that left-hand corner uh, these curves are, uh, the better the model is doing. So the axes have the true positive rate and the false positive rate on them. And ideally, we want um, both of those to be great. We want the model to be you know, very good at, uh, uh, at both cases. So this is another example of a model uh, evaluation visual idiom familiar to modeling practitioners that can be used to compare models, to assess a model, um, and so forth. So these kinds of visual idioms are a great fit for automatic plotting methods. When we talked about EDA, I highlighted the need for like a really flexible plotting framework that can be used to create um, any kind of plot fluent, fluently and adopting uh, the, a grammar that lets uh, like someone learn the grammar and then um, be able to create anything they want in this really flexible way. A lot of model evaluation plots are the same every single time we make them and uh, practitioners can be better served using shortcuts that are built um, by tool builders like, like my team and me um, because it can be a hassle to copy and paste the, um, the same code for an ROC curve every single time. However, um, not all plots for model evaluation are these kinds of standard idioms that are considered normal and typical. This is an, this is an evaluation plot. Um, it's for a model predicting the class of a volcano. And each hexagon um, shows the percent of volcanoes that have been classified correctly in that little um, area. Uh, on the earth. So while knowing about some key automatic plotting methods um, are a useful part about um, a useful part of like the visualization toolkit for machine learning practitioners, still having that fluency in a flexible visualization system is really important. There's not always going to be um, an automatic method or one of these idioms for the uh, to visualize model performance in the way that you need to. I focus so far on model evaluation plots that show us as practitioners how models are performing in terms of some metric like RMSE or accuracy or or something like that. Um, but model evaluation activities can also encompass model explanation and visualization is also a key tool for explaining models. Model explanations fall into two categories. The first are global explanations where we, um, we evaluate what features are important in a model predictions and a model's predictions overall. This plot is from that example of the San Francisco trees data set and the length of the bars here uh, correspond to how important that feature is in predicting uh, who maintains the tree uh, for a random forest model. Um, globally for the whole model overall. So having a private caretaker is um, most important in predicting um, who is uh, responsible for the maintaining, for being the maintainer. Um, and then after that, the um, spatial information is the most important after that. The other kind of model explanation is um, feature importance at the individual observation level. Uh, this is also called local feature importance. So there's multiple ways to do this um, for uh, models that are not, um, you know, linear models where it's clear how the global and local are related. So this particular plot shows an example of um, Shapley additive explanations um, for a passenger on the Titanic and a model predicting whether or not um, uh, he would survive 
or where the, the Shapley value there is uh, the average contribution of a feature in various contributions or um, what are called coalitions. So the box plots here show the distributions of the values and the bars show the um, the average contributions, but just for that individual, not for the model as a whole. So for both global and observation level model explanations, these plots are used by the creators of these machine learning systems to evaluate and to understand them. And at this stage of the modeling process, we are again at a point of important human decisions and model explanation together with model evaluation can be used to make choices about which model to use, whether, um, whether the performance is adequate, whether fairness is adequate. So through this whole exploration of data visualization and the machine learning process, we've focused on plots made by system designers and operators for themselves as a tool to make better modeling choices. So these are plots made by practitioners for practitioners. Um, often discussions about data visualization um, centered as a communication tool. And of course it 100% is, but in this talk we focused on some of its other, um, some of its other uh, functions or uses, like its ability to be used by a system designer to understand the system better. It, uh, recently in the machine learning community, I've been, it, I've, uh, been cl uh, following um, discussions about uh, participatory approaches to machine learning where the system designer purposefully partners with those impacted by, um, by the system, like the users of the system in, the, um, in shaping and designing the system. I think this is going to be really interesting to watch because this kind of practice and approach will have to impact systems or will have to impact choices through the whole, the whole modeling process, like that whole schematic that I showed, including what kinds of plots that we make and how we make them. It may change the answer to this question here, who are these plots for? What I don't think it will change is the main purpose of any given visualization. So some plots are created to help us understand the data that we start with. Um, the, this is the input for the models that we create. So investing in data visualization uh, to understand data is like laying a strong foundation. Some plots are created to help us um, understand the models that we create, the output. So careful visualization practices in model evaluation sets us up for success in models that are as accurate, uh, as appropriate, and as reliable as possible. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. I want to say a big thanks to Pluralsight for having me and thank you to my teammates on the Tidy Models team and also to um, the Tidy Tuesday team. Tidy Tuesday is a social data science project and most of the data sets that I showed today were from Tidy Tuesday. Hi everyone, my name's Nick Sinai. Uh, I'm a senior advisor at Insight Partners, uh, advisor to Pluralsight and former US Deputy Chief Technology Officer. I'm really excited about this next panel with Roger Miller and Lester Diamond. Um, and so I'm just gonna turn it right over to them for the lightning introductions. Uh, Roger, over to you. Uh, yes, sir. Hello, uh, my name is Roger Miller. I'm the uh, Acting Principal Deputy Director of the FBI's Terror Screening Center. And Lester, over to you. I am the Associate Commissioner for, the, for Financial Management and Support at the Social Security Administration for the Office of Systems. Um, and in that, in that role, I also manage um, talent management for the, the IT organization. Great. Well, this is going to be a really fun panel with the, with the two of you. Um, you know, upskilling the, the uh, existing talent uh, workforce that we've got is a really interesting and challenging topic. 
given the, the context that we're all operating in today. Uh, so let me give you some, some opening uh, context and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Um, so the, the first piece is, this is uh, something that is not unique to government, is, is digital transformation, right? To, employ, to improve employee and customer experiences. And of course, your mission sets may be a little different with social security, uh, improving the, the digital experience for social security beneficiaries, right? And Roger at the FBI, thinking about the services and information that FBI agents and, and others inside the FBI need to have access to, uh, to fight crime and terrorism. But both of you are going through digital transformations, right? And this is true of any large enterprise, public or private. Uh, digital transformation is, is practically a cliche. Now, on the federal side of the house, we also have a graying of the IT workforce. Right, two thirds of our of our uh, IT workforce is 40 years or, or older, and uh, candidly, we're not recruiting and retaining enough young technologists. And we have this big push for cloud, cyber, and AI, which means new languages, platforms, frameworks, and yet we still have some pretty impressive big iron systems. Uh, Lester, you probably can you know, compete Roger on that, but both of you probably have some some interesting stuff that has been around for not just years, but uh, decades, mainframes, COBOL, you name it. Um, and, and you know, we're operating in a really challenging and interesting time in 2020 with COVID. And a lot of folks have said uh, that it's accelerating digital transformation on the order of a decade uh, in just this, this one year. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, it's definitely uh, brought some new stresses to the system and, and accelerated uh, some, some digital transformation. And maybe it's opened up some some remote talent pools. Uh, it's definitely accelerated the collaboration uh, emphasis, right, on collaboration tech. tech. Uh, but there's also some some big downsides in terms of increasing the attack surface and making some things more challenging. And the final backdrop I'll give before we jump in is the uh, the overlay of an administration that is focused on IT modernization and IT talent upskilling is a big focus. Uh, from the White House, uh, from CIOs and, and senior officials. And um, I'll just as one small example, the federal data strategy, which uh, has a series of milestones this year, uh, it requires agencies to gauge the data skills of the workforce. Uh, and then the final bit is, is the, you know, we're likely to have a CR uh, in the new federal fiscal year, a continuing resolution for our non-federal uh, guests. Um, and uh, so that means not a lot of additional funding and training and travel are kind of these natural targets. Uh, and we have a, a presidential election coming and, and, and uh, either a second term or a change in administration. So a lot of big things going on. And yet the two of you have been driving some really interesting uh, workforce transformation strategies over the last year. And so um, maybe we'll start with you, Lester. You know, where are you in your digital transformation journey and how does IT upskilling or how does upskilling the IT workforce fit into that? So, so digital transformation has been a priority of ours for several years now. We had an IT mo uh, modernization plan we put out in 2017 that described in broad terms how we were going to um, leverage IT uh, for, to improve the, the customer experience and provide you know, uh, more services online to, to the customers. Um, we began back initially focusing more on the back end. Um, now with the with the current commissioner and the current CIO, we're focusing very much on delivering uh, front end uh, capability online. Um, we would like to make the internet our, our the SSA.gov site the first place people come for to interact with the Social Security um, uh, Administration. Um, we still have our uh, 1,100 or so field offices and 150 hearing offices, but but we are very quickly moving toward um, providing channel parity um, across the um, the field organization, the field offices certainly. Um, hearings, um, we're also making headway on, on enabling them online. Uh, we've been offering video hearings for several for several years, um, but it's been it's been rather limited um, with hearings between. Um, our field offices, our hearing offices, and the administrative law judges in their offices, and then with a few of the large uh, appointed representatives um, or um, uh, people who can represent uh, claimants and, and a, a few of the larger offices there. Now we're, we're moving that out so people can do it um, much more freely. That was something that came with COVID. Um, the um, the the push for channel parity, though, is something that that we have been doing for a few years. 
Um, and we've just given it a name and begun to emphasize it. But this has been a, a longer journey for us. Um, certainly the back end, we've got a lot of big iron in the back end. We, um, we're still running with, um, with, you know, with eight mainframes spread across a couple different um, sites, um, basically four primary and then, and then the backups. Um, and, and we're working our way off of them. But, but frankly, with our focus on the front end, um, that's getting most of our attention. Moving off big iron is not nearly uh, as high a priority for us as getting the services out to the, um, to the public. Great, and Roger, where are you guys in your digital transformation broadly at the FBI, but also more specifically in the, the Terra Center? Yeah, so first off, uh, just hearing the stuff that Lester's doing is encouraging for us because you know we're a smaller division within the greater scope of the FBI, which is within the greater scope of the Department of Justice. We're Lester seeing that big enterprise kind of transition push. We're kind of one of those components that are moving right along. So it kind of fits in perfectly to have me go next because we're looking at how do we become agile as an enterprise and that digital transformation to, to align to our, our, our CIO's office, to the bigger FBI IT branch, to us as a multi-agency organization. And where we work, we have an influx of all the, the U.S. intelligence community and U.S. government working together to fight terrorism and other national security threats. So for us, we also have to not only look at how we're going to transform, but how does that align to what our partners are doing in the U.S. government? And as, sure, as Lester could attest, and Nick, you know from, from the work you've done with us uh, in the government in the past, that it's not as easy as us just getting together around the table and making a decision. We all have our own prioritization lists. Uh, we monitor our sprints differently on how we measure it. Uh, and oftentimes we can be developing something and then be put on hold while we wait for our other components to catch up because of their own uh, budgetary or uh, operational needs. So for us at the TSC or the Terrorist Screening Center, what we're doing is we are just now migrating uh, our plants into the cloud environment. We recognize very quickly uh, our job can't stop. Uh, as the, the sole government uh, consolidated watch list for the U.S. government, we have got to make sure we're online 24 hours a day to protect the homeland. If we're not, then there's a greater risk to our country. So we have to have tools and we have to have platforms in place, and not, not single platforms, but redundant platforms that will allow us to do our mission. Uh, historically, we've worked on a prim environment uh, where everything has been internal, but we recognize there's a lot of gaps, there's a lot of uh, cost. And what I'm sure Lester could uh, to attest to as well is that, and those in the audience will know, is that the more you build on a, on a legacy system, the more it becomes a Frankenstein of different parts. And pretty soon we get away from that original uh, concept that brought us efficiencies in the beginning. So what we're doing is we are migrating to that cloud environment for uh, multiple levels of classification. Uh, with our different partners to ensure that the, the, the information that we work in and that the data that we deal with can get to all those that need it to make informed decisions for investigations, uh, encounters uh, that occur at the, uh, the different borders, et cetera. Uh, but it's more than just that, because what we saw in the COVID environment is how many of us in the government had to shut down. And a lot of us in the private sector, we kind of grinded to a halt because we were trying not to spread this. Uh, so how do we handle continuity of operations? When we think about a coup for continuity operations, we think about what do we do when, if a terrorist attack hits the, the, the D.C., Maryland, Virginia, DMV area? What do we do if we get shut down because of some type of major uh, catastrophe? But what about a, a disease? What about where P employees can no longer come to work because we had a COVID case or we get a COVID case? Fortunately, we have not. But should we get one and it shuts the entire operations center down? And that's a 24-hour-a-day center that's available for our state, local, and federal partners to call in whenever they, they deal with this type of threat. So for us, it was how do we implement and then get away from this hybrid, this, 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 this uh, prim environment, legacy environment, and get to a place where it doesn't matter where we're at. We can log in from anywhere, uh, any place where we can have a classified system at 56 different field offices, not to count how many resident agencies we have, and all of our different partners that work at different enclaves, classified enclaves, so we can continue to do our work. And kind of talking about how the upscaling piece in the IT workforce comes in, that's really where Pluralsight came in. And, and I think for the purposes of today, I really want to talk about over the course of the last year, how we've been able to use this platform to actually enhance this capability, right? Uh, as Lester will tell you, and Nick, I know you know this, it doesn't matter how much we push from the top. If we don't provide the tools for our employees to be successful, we're just grinding our wheels and another year passes by, a new administration comes in. Or in the case of the FBI, we have new assistant directors and deputy assistant directors at the executive level coming in every single day. And what is the one thing they all say? 
I don't understand that IT stuff. You guys figure it out. Just tell me what I need to know. Well, you know what? Pluralsight gives you that. And I can tell you from firsthand, um, I have been a user of it from the beginning. I was an operational guy that moved into the IT sector two years ago, and it changed the way I do business today. Um, so I, I really want to hit on the fact that, you know, we have legacy systems where we have subject matter experts that are losing relevancy as we shift into new technology. That doesn't mean we let that workforce go. We have actually got to invest in them. And this is a platform that actually allows us to do it. Not only can we invest in them, but we can also look at the assessments on the back end to see if they are grasping that, or do we need to provide them more resources and mentoring that will help them with that path moving forward. Um, and I think we as leaders owe them that opportunity. I mean, whether it's the, the engineer or the developers in the trenches, or it's, it's Lester and I making informed executive decisions on what technology to fund and approve. If we can't have the conversation at the basic level with our staff, how are we going to know how to advocate for what they need? Well, that's a really great setup, Roger. Thank you. Uh, Lester, how are you thinking about the shift from, from uh, classroom to online? How are you thinking about, we used to have a little bit more standardized, and now we can move to, to more personalized uh, content. Uh, how do you think about all that? So, so we see, we see um, actually the the uh, the the need for for multiple modes. Uh, so, so when when COVID hit, and we we canceled our classroom courses. Of course, we've been we've been working for Social Security has been working from home almost entirely for the since uh, since beginning of March. Um, we have everybody is um, is available to to telework. Um, we have some people who have to be on site for facilities and the data centers, obviously, but it's but it's drawn down substantially, um, and and we haven't done classroom training in, in in that time. So what we did was a few things. Um, we we pivoted quickly. We looked at our classroom courses, and, and and I will say that we were already facing some challenges because we have been primarily in in terms of the IT organization. We've been primarily driven. We've been primarily located in our in our um, headquarters. Um, uh, complex in um, just outside Baltimore, uh, and and we did have a data center. We do have a data center down um, in the Mid Atlantic area, a little further south than us, and we have a, a rather large facility these days out um, in Colorado. Um, so we were we were getting more demand to be able to offer training across those different sites. Um, so we were beginning to to deal with it, but the way we were dealing with it was video into a classroom, which was useful. Um, but didn't really set us up for for what we're facing now. So what we did back in um, by April is we pivoted quickly. We worked with our vendors who were doing the classroom training, um, identified a platform that we could use that uh, across you know, through our firewalls because we're not as secure uh, as Roger is, but but we're rather secure. Um, and and solving that, we we began offering our classroom training in um, uh, online. Um, the classroom training is very useful for us because we it's a larger organization. We're looking to upskill quite a few people. We 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 have the basic technology knowledge that we want to convey, but we also have knowledge about our systems that that you can't you can't buy that knowledge. You can't have a vendor train on it. Um, you know, it needs to be us training about our systems. Um, at the same time, uh, we're understanding that classroom training is often not delivered at just the right time. Um, you'll you'll deliver it, and then the work doesn't start. You know, we try to deliver it to people as they're be, um, just before they're going to begin working in the area, and sometimes three, six, nine months goes by before the work actually starts up as we expected. And then what happens is you put them on a project and you say, "Well, I I know I studied this, but I really don't remember it that well," and you have to start over again. So so we're we're developing an approach that that uses classroom training, or more more and more of it will be virtual, of course. Or forever, not just we won't go back to just classroom training once we can go back into the office. But we're going to combine that with coaching and mentoring. So we'll take people from training, we'll put them on to specific work, we'll have that all planned out for them. Um, they'll be coached by more experienced um, developers and analysts on the, and this is mostly on the development side. The infrastructure data center operation side is a little bit different for us. Um, and and, and so we'll provide them with that on-ramp to uh, bring them from a you know, basic awareness to early knowledge through journeymen to become expert in those areas. And we we'll do it through this, this coaching and mentoring. Um, we haven't worked out yet how we're going to do um, uh, competency 
assessments, but uh, the coaches they're working with will be an important part of that. Uh, once they're on a job, once they're producing code, um, we're going to be reviewing their code by these experienced developers. We'll be able to provide them feedback. We're not going uh, entirely to, you know, the 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 um, the peer compute the peer computing peer development kind of mode, but it, it will have elements of that. And, and we're also, and this is so now we're we're um, an organization like uh, Pluralsight comes in, is that we also want to make it more of an open market for skills development. So self-initiated, um, you know, self-driven. Um, you know, non-synchronous, so we don't have to schedule classes. People will will get time to to do training online, and Pluralsight um, is is an important um, provider of that to us. Um, understanding that that there are other providers, especially in some of the specialty areas, but um, um, but we want to make training something that you don't get nominated for too long. It was seen as a reward for good performance. Instead, it's going to be driven by um the uh, our needs and their aspirations um without the managers necessarily intervening as the as the the um the people who who nominate their staff for training um so the upscaling and and so um we are looking to pearl site for people to become for instance with um angular is a framework that we're using um uh, quite a bit um we've sent a lot of people through training um and uh, and um, and then I got a, an email from one of my bosses uh, a couple months ago saying, why don't we have Angular trainings? I thought you were training them. And I wrote back and said, well, we trained 85 of them last year. Um, we should have enough. And we wrote to the project manager, we need a seasoned Angular developer. And I said, well, you know, if you don't put them on work, they're not going to be seasoned. We can't keep doing this. Um, so so the, the coaching will play a role in there. The, the intentionality of getting them on work as they, as they exit the training and also enabling them to go back and refresh uh, through, you know, through Pluralsight and um, to get that knowledge again. If they need a refresh, we don't need to put them through training again. We can we can um, have them reach out, you know, um, access the Pluralsight um, that capability that, that we uh, brought on board. So if I, if I build on that last one, it sounds like there's a, a balance between prescriptive training or required training then there's uh, um, self-guided training or, or allowing people to develop their own their own interests as well. Um, and so there's the, that mix be, mix between between the two, mm -hmm. uh, and then you balance that with coaching and staffing right on on the projects because there's a certain amount of of, of training by doing, and then there's then there's uh, uh, formal uh, training programs and and self-guided training programs. So it all kind of comes together, right? right. Uh, Roger, pivoting to you, I'm, I'm curious how you think about this, this balance between um, letting letting folks skill up on things they're interested in because, uh, you know, the, the employees sometimes know best and they're able to go out and get the skills where the industry is going uh, versus uh, being prescriptive about roles and prescriptive about the skills and the roles and the certs and the roles. And so how do you balance that? Clearly, a security engineer, you want to say, has has to have a certain uh, set of skills and a certain set of certs, uh, but we see people who are reinventing themselves as cloud engineers or data scientists, and we want to we, we want to allow for that and and uncover those gems where someone may not have been formally hired in that job series or trained that way, but we can move them into being you know uh, web engineers or data scientists. Yeah, that, that's a great question, and and it's actually comforting to see that in the governments, it doesn't matter what agency you work for, we're thinking the same way as far as how do we blend those two together. So, uh, so I've been a little biased here because in the 30 years of law enforcement I've been a part of, I've done 20 in the education, writing curriculum, training, and developing, and in uh, and, and, and both hybrid, you know, traditional and, and online platforms. So. Uh, it's very near and dear skills development. As a matter of fact, for our assistant director, the director of the Care Screening Center, uh, he stresses mentoring and training as a whole. And we know in the COVID situation, while it has forced us to kind of move away from some of the traditional means, it's probably one of the benefits that have come out of this tragedy because it's allowed us to actually get away from historical ways of doing things and push towards new alternatives in education. So for me, I, I definitely think that there has to be, right? We, we, we want our staff to use Pluralsight, for example, to learn how to in, do their assigned work and how to uh, enhance their, their capabilities of doing their job, right? Because we want, we want high level quality of instruction. We want them to have access to that, that they're, they're not going to get right now in this current environment. But what we're seeing is that 
when we provide them structure, and one of the good things about uh, this particular platform is it provides the channels, as Lester had even talked about, provides us channels that we can use to give them structured format. So they walk in from day one knowing where to go. And I think when you look at the different platforms that are out there that we've probably all tried in one form or the other, either personally or professionally, you kind of get a license and historically we'll buy a whole bunch of things and we'll say, okay, there you go. And by the way, I need you to be AWS certified. I'll give you three months. But I have no clue what it takes to be AWS certified, right? But many of you that are watching do. And you know that it's not as easy as that. You need to have some type of, of, of ability. But that hopefully through that structure makes the platform not so intimidating. And it actually, you start seeing the value, right? And that's where we get to that return on investment. So not only are they benefiting the division by providing a pathway to be innovative so we can protect the nation in our case, but we're also getting them to explore a little bit more personally to see what's out there, to, to go after their passions, right? Or perhaps they see another employee that's working on a really neat project on machine learning and they want to know a little bit more about machine learning. And then they get on the course like I happen to do and they realize, wow, this is pretty fascinating. Oh, and by the way, there's a difference between AI and machine learning. So they start going down that path. The next, you know, they're in a rabbit hole of different information. The neat thing is now their supervisor, in our case, our, our supervisors are part of this process. They can go in the back end because, for example, Pluralsight, for those that don't know, have the auditing feature that allows us to see what they're taking. We can do skills assessments to see where they rank, and I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit. But it provides them an avenue to see who knows things that we didn't even know they were interested in. And then we find that they have a skill talent rating that is actually very high. Their aptitudes are really strong in these areas. So we might have just found the next generation of, of tech leaders that we didn't even know exist. And going back to the last question, it actually could have been one of those legacy SMEs who had to redefine their careers because we're shifting from a, a prem environment to a cloud environment. And we realized this guy is a phenomenal scrum master. Who would have thought? So I think for me, it's it's you start with what we need, mission needs, right? Because we're funding a process, we're purchasing licenses that we want to build their skills up to, to, to handle the mission that we're involved in. But if we do it the right way, from all the way being invested at the top to our employees, I think the personalization piece, that personalized desire is going to come out of that because they're going to see the value. And, and we all know at the end of the day, it's about what's in it for me. And if we can hook them from the very beginning with the product to, to advance our mission, I think that we get a better employee overall and a better division and morale will go up as a result. That's a really good, really good point, Roger. And, and uh, to some of my opening comments, uh, professional development uh, is one of those things that is important in the next generation. So as we think about the graying of the workforce, uh, showing that we're, we're, we're committed to, to uh, upskilling and continually uh, improving the skills of, of, of professionals is going to be something important. Uh, you had mentioned ROI. I want to kind of keep going, double clicking on that. Lester, maybe we'll start with you and then come back to Roger if you have additional comments. How do you think about the ROI of, of upskilling investments? Uh, what metrics are you tracking? How are you, you thinking about all this? So while we're driving ROI quite a bit for, as we adopt new technologies, um, and because we can we can look at productivity and issues like that in a in a in a fairly direct way when it comes to broader adoption of technologies, um, we haven't done it as much in terms of training. Uh, the training challenge for us is really a matter of getting uh, the right people trained up in the right time frame to be available to work on the teams um, that they that where, where we need them and to be operating at a at a level of expertise that that's um, that enables us to accomplish the uh, the goals of the um, of the the products that they're working on. Um, so what we end up measuring is really um, whether teams are slowed because the technology is not because the technologists aren't available. Um, we measure whether people have the understanding to um, be productive on the teams. Um, as time goes on, especially with the, uh, as we move toward the coaching that I told you about before and the evaluation of the coaches of the, the people who, um, who are coming out of our training regime, um, we'll be able to see how effective they are, how effective our training is in getting people up to speed quickly. But, but we honestly have not tried to bring a dollar, um, a dollar to it at this point. Uh, ROI. I'm curious, both metrics of, of online training, if you, what kind of metrics you can, or KPIs you, you measure, and then, and then whether you've, you've tried to uh, generate an ROI here. Right. So it, it's, we do a little bit different, right, than what you probably historically look at ROI, and I'll set some context if I may. So um, we, 
at the at the TSC, we are very contract heavy. So we we have about one government IT employee per thirteen or so contractors. Uh, the average for the bureau for us, I would say, guessing would be about one to four. So you can see already that we're very con we're very contractor heavy. So I need to have some type of measure because. For example, when we spend these licenses and we buy licenses for our staff, we buy it for the government staff, not the contractor side. But the private sector already has a lot of this information, and they are navigating throughout the different agencies, and they are getting these skills developments because that's part of the statement of work to bring them in. So we need to have a way to measure innovation through our government employees as well. So what we do is a, is a couple of things. So uh, for our government employees, we have actually built in their performance plans uh, X amount of time that they need to spend in the Pluralsight platform. Uh, one, because that's our first return on investment, right? Because if we're going to spend money on these uh, to, to build our future, we also need to make sure that we're providing some type of way to change the culture than what was historically done before. Not to say left, left on their own devices, you know, strong performing employees aren't going to go out and get training. They are, but the employee that comes in, they come in, they work their, their, their eight hour, their 10 hour, their 12 hour shift outside the scope of their their day-to-day -day works and in our staff they are working 100% they often don't have the outlet or they don't prioritize or they're not given the opportunity to prioritize their types of training so what we do is for each employee within the government employee in their performance plan they have to do x amount of hours per month um, the supervisors are not out of this they're part of the process too they actually they're in their performance plan is how they're meeting regularly with their staff going through the auditing feature to see what their strengths are, where their deficiencies are at, and how they're coaching them, either in their passion areas or their assigned work areas where they're taking the training, whether it's an engineering program, whether it's like hyperconvergence, or if it's uh, they're working on the cloud environment. So once that's done, then the, the staff and the supervisors are also uh, required to give staff time away from their cubes where they can have dedicated skills development time. So for me, the way I can measure that return on investment is I can go really right into their annual performance plans that we're about to start uh, and see who has been actively doing this. And not only does it give us a chance to see where our strengths are, but it also tells me as a senior leader, who do I need to focus on so they understand the importance of this, this skills development process, right? So uh, that's kind of how we're, we're using this and how we measure it. Now, I want to tell you right now, there's an intangible that we haven't even spoken about, and this is the best part about it. So if you want to talk about a real ROI, it's the intangible. It's me walking up to a developer or an engineer and saying, hey, what are you working on? They say, hey, we think we know a way where we could get to our different environments that are just internal to this building, we can build a pathway through a process using this software from engineering that'll do it. And then the developer says, you know what? I have an idea where we can take AI and now we can use this and we can start tracking. So if we have a critical infrastructure issue, it won't take us two hours to get in the building. We can do it right from our house. And having those one-on-one -on -one conversations, but I want to pull back and take even a step further. As a senior leader, I use the platform so I can have educated and informed conversations with them. So when I sit there and say, great, man, how are our operations folks involved? And say, oh, we're going to have them right in the middle and we're going to, to, to bring them in. We're going to develop this together. Oh, so we're talking about agile as an enterprise. And for them having executive staff that are actually engaged and are investing in them, it makes them want to invest more in us. That's the real ROI for me. So, it's, so if I could just add a, a little bit of context off of that, just to give you a sense of of scale, we um, the Office of Systems in at SSA is about uh, three thousand people. Um, around a thousand of them work in the data centers. The uh, uh, a few hundred work in sort of support organizations, and and so there are roughly fifteen hundred developers and analysts. Um, around. Um, and so th those are the people I'm talking about mostly with the, with this training we're doing. The data center, we we handle a little bit differently. Um, they do you we do classroom training we do with them. They do use online, you know, self-initiated asynchronous kind of training like we would look to Pluralsight for. Um, but but really most of it is uh, most of our focus so far has been on the um, with the developers. And, and we have quite a few contractors, not not like Roger has. We have about um, about two contractors for every three employees, maybe one and a half for every three. Um, so it's so it's it's a very it's a very different makeup. Um, we have not gotten to the point where we have um, explicitly given our employees time to do training on their own. Um, we need to do that. They have the capability of doing it, but we haven't created that expectation yet. Um, and that is um, that is a direction that that 
we probably will be going. Uh, we just developed an IT workforce strategy. It was first released just about a year ago, and we're continuing to build it out. And this talent management work around this training primarily is a is a big piece of that. But um, we're doing you know we're do, we're we're organizing the training for all these people with about um, six or seven people, and so we're we're taking it piece by piece. I want to build a little bit on something that both of you guys have talked about, especially Roger was this idea of of digital fluency outside of of the developer. And Lester, you probably have one of the biggest group of developers that are actually feds. Uh, at least in the federal civilian government, right? As, as most people have, you know, maybe IRS or CMS also have have uh, some think, developers, but you're you're up there in terms of of actual feds who are developers. I think uh, the IRS is a little bit bigger. CMS is mostly contracts, but you're you're better looking, um, <laughs> and, and you you have the the coolest ones around. Um, and so, but what's what's interesting is is uh, tech and digital fluency, right? Which is 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 something that I I see uh, tech executives talk a lot about because one for them to connect with other executives, but also with the with the acquisition workforce, right? We have we have a really large acquisition workforce because what we do is, is actually more typical of the FBI than Social Security across across government. For those of us joining who are uh, less familiar with the federal government, is we tend to have a lot of a lot of uh, federal project managers. Uh, who are overseeing contractors who are doing a lot of the development? That's probably more common in in federal government. Um, and in that in that case, uh, the, the acquisitions, you know, of these of these contracts and the technical fluency and the ability to project manage once they, those contracts have been let, that is as important as the hands-on development work in in, in many cases, right? Um, and so this there's this uh, need for for greater digital competency and digital fluency, even if you're not going to be the, the hands-on keyboard developing an app or trying to solve a particular you know, AI problem to trace a particular asset or something like that. Uh, so uh, maybe starting with, with you, Roger, how do you, how do you think about broader uh, digital fluency? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Let me think about this one for a second. I've been trying to how I want to frame it. So. I may not go down the path you want, but I think it's a path I kind of like to talk to the group about. Uh, first off, I want to kind of say and, and, and set the tone that I am very blessed. I have a phenomenal staff. Matter of fact, if you walk into our building, we have about 130 IT folks spread out in three different locations. Um, you won't know the difference between a government employee and a contractor because we integrate so well together. Matter of fact, our director, one of his main missions is that we do not separate the two together. They work interchangeably. Obviously, the government employees have to make the decisions. But uh, kind of going from the acquisition piece that, that stands out to me, and, and if I don't answer your question, please ask me to, 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 to restate it again. But uh, one of the things I noticed when I came over, because not only do I have uh, IT, but I also have budget and I have the contracts and, and security and other areas as well. But one of the things I noticed from a contract side of the house is you need to get our contracting representatives involved in the process from the beginning. So when we're actually trying to frame out what the requirements and what the work, what we're trying to be innovative, what we're trying to develop, we had a lot of gaps. And, and while I can't go into specifics of those because I'll have contractor employees watching this uh, for, for the, uh, the conference, I can tell you that um, it's very important that we have all the right players in the room at the same time. That includes your, con your contract. Uh, representative, officer representative, because they have to be able to help write the requirements in such a way that we are driving our, our digital transformation where we need it to go. And unfortunately, in the past, oftentimes we have those of us that are not experts in those areas writing the requirements, which we should be involved in, but we certainly don't understand some of the, the gaps or pitfalls that may exist. Uh, so having them in the process to help us get through it and then expand on those areas that we're not familiar with, whether it be uh, the difference between uh, uh, a labor category code or uh, the style of work. Uh, for me, as I'm hearing you talk about that digital fluency, it's the way we do the acquisition, the way we get those individuals together, and we, we build this contract will make or break us over the next several years. And to the point that for us, we have actually slow road a couple of things just to make sure we got it right. And that's not even touching some of the, the gov bigger government parameters like Small Business Administration, um, and, and other contract vehicles that are out there. And for, well, I'm blessed for Lester that he doesn't have to deal with. The FBI has its own set of, uh, of, of instructions that go outside of what the GSI schedule is. So uh, for me, as I hear your question, 
I'm thinking broader as far as how do we integrate everyone together to ensure that um, we're actually letting the, the private sector know, the contractor companies know what we're trying to gain uh, and having the contract representative to be a part of that process. How about you, Lester? How do you think about digital fluency outside your core developers? So, so the way we do development, uh, we almost all of our almost all of our contracting is through is um, effectively staff augmentation. We work with them on teams. Um, we provide the project management. Um, we provide the definition of the work. So, so what we really contract for are uh, numbers of people with specific skills at specific levels. And 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 we manage we manage the work of them as through their through their channels, uh, you know, uh, uh, through their management um, along, and and uh, along with our project management, our scrum masters and um, and the rest of it. Um, so so it's actually interesting. We just got a GAO audit, and they had one recommendation that was to to better define the role of the contracting officers and the contracting officer representatives um, in in agile. Um, so, and, and, and so we, we actually argued back a little bit saying, well, we don't really have to define these roles better in their position descriptions because that's our process supports it. Um, we didn't have to do that kind of, uh, they, they needed to write a recommendation for us. So, so we, we didn't push back too hard. And I say that with all due respect, I used to work at government accountability office. So, um, so I understand how these things go, but we, we really work closely with the, um, with our primary vendors, we we uh, we have three primary um, um, IT skills vendors that that we work with. We've worked with them uh, for a number of years, and um, and we have that kind of relationship with them. So when we ask for a person with Angular skills at the at a journeyman level at at that labor category at the appropriate labor category, that's what we get, and they and they work they work with us. Um, so some of the need for that kind of deeper um, uh, digital fluency may it may not be needed. It's um, we we work that once our once the contracting people um, put together the right kind of statement of work, working with the project managers, working with the the technical SMEs, we then work with the vendor to bring in the right people, and it and it moves into the project stage pretty quickly. So so I don't know if we finessed it or or we just are ignoring it, but it hasn't been that part of it hasn't been an issue for us. I, I also manage um, all the contracts um, or most of the contracts in the office of systems um, and, and the budget and um, and we count on our technical experts to guide us there um, the the contracting officer representatives are in my organization and while they are very talented contracting professionals with uh, um, years of experience in IT um, they're not as deeply skilled in the in the specific technologies as you would need them to be if you were contracting for technology products, I guess right. is the way I put it. And and where we do have contracting for technology products, for instance, some of our early entry into AI, we procured a tool and their support in implementing it. Um, that work, we work side by side with our technical experts. Um, so that's, that, that's not an entirely satisfying answer, but it's where we are and it's been effective for us. That's great. Um, I guess I want to want to end on this this topic that we we teased out a little bit, but maybe just continue on this topic of um, uh, essentially someone someone changing changing roles or or uh, being repurposed. Roger, you talked a little bit about these subject matter experts who who were uh, experts on a particular technology, and then they're being being uh, they're able to use platforms like Pluralsight to get smart on on newer technologies and be technical SMEs. Uh, in the area of cybersecurity, for example, this is something that the uh, the administration has been very focused on launching a, uh, a reskilling academy. It's been kind of very limited in terms of the number of people that have gone through it. Uh, but there's there have been a number of outside think tanks that have talked about the cybersecurity gap uh, skills and, and, and professionals, uh, uh, both in industry and in and in uh, um, government. So uh, this. And, and I'm also cognizant of the challenges of, of recruiting. Like we're definitely working on making civil service more attractive and thinking about terms of uh, tours of duty and all these things in federal government. But uh, these these changes are a little slow in coming for, you know, when you're re recruiting against some of the, the, the top tech companies and top finance company or financial uh, institutions for, for tech talent, right? 
And so I think we can always sell mission of, of, of helping the, the security net uh, and, and helping Americans get the benefits they deserve and, and helping track and catch the bad guys, right? Those are appealing missions that I know you guys are both passionate about and, and something that, that we can get, get young folks excited about, but we're not gonna be able to get enough folks in fast enough. And so uh, helping repurpose and, and, and reskill folks, not just from, from mainframes to cloud, but also in, in this area of, of, of cybersecurity. I uh, wonder if we could, could end there. Uh, I'll start with, with you, Roger. All right, so it, you know, now we, we've touched cybersecurity in ways uh, for the Terra Screen Center, so I won't go, I can't go into detail on that. But, but what I can tell you is that I think there's something to um, our existing workforce that they need to know that you're invested in them. I mean, think about this for a second. As, as we're shifting and modernizing technology like we've been talking about today, as we're making these huge cultural shifts in the way we do business, I mean, there's anxiety that comes when you've been doing something the same way for several years. And I know I'm not alone in the Bureau because I have counterparts in other divisions where we've had these conversations and they work at a scale five times my own uh, with their staffing. And they're, they're encountering the same issues. And I, I would imagine Lester is, is seeing the same thing where they need to know that we're there for them first and foremost, right? Like as, as an executive, I could just focus on the mission, right? Like, so for me, it's, it's how do we let them know one, that we care, Two, that there's a there's there's an avenue and a resource for them to to uh, develop their skills, right? And, and three, that that it's going to be utilized once they have done these skills, and they're going to get the opportunities that perhaps younger folks coming into the workforce um, may have more knowledge. But if you give these this 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 legacy SME a chance, they can actually reach up to that level. And sometimes we're quick to just rip off the Band-Aid and put someone else new in when maybe we just need to refocus what they're doing and putting them somewhere else, re revitalize their, their careers. But I think there's something more that we can do with this. And one of the things that I've challenged uh, our staff to do, and, and I'm sure they're going to meet the challenge because they're going to be watching this. So that everything I'm saying I'm held accountable to is I want them to build these channels. And we've already got them. Like one of the ways this works, one of the if you want Pluralsight to work for your organization, whether you're government or not, but I'll speak to what I know, and that is government, you need to have someone dedicated to handling Pluralsight. You can't just say, okay, here's your licenses, and by the way, unit chief, branch chief, supervisor, figure it out. Make sure they take their training. I put a lot of money into this. You can't do that. You need to have someone that is actually going to invest, digging into the back end, looking at who are my top 10 performers this month. Oh, by the way, the first time we did it here at the TSE, the top two performers were the executives. The highest, the second and third level executive uh, were the highest, one from DHS and one from the FBI, who did more than 50 hours more than everybody else because they, they were invested in it, right? So for me, that was a, 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 a quick win to show that from the top down, we are, we are invested in you. So I want to take these channels. And what I want to do, and I hope other people and other IT folks from the Bureau are watching this because I'm challenging you as well. I am going to put our channels up on our internal TSC SharePoint site. So Tony, if you're listening, get ready. You're going to, to put that up there because anytime we have an opening in IT in the FBI's Terror Screening Center, I want every IT person out there in the field across the nation to go to our website and say, oh, if I want to work in IT, I should take these classes in Pluralsight. And they go back in and when they walk into their interview, we can build in an assessment piece that says not only that, but before you walk in, it's not just your resume I want to see. And it's not just, you know, that, that you're taking these channels. How did you score on your assessment in this area on, uh, on AWS, which is the platform that we're looking to have an engineer for? I want to have that. To me, if, if you're a legacy employee and you know that there is a division out there that is putting this all on the table, it's going to tell you that's a place that's going to invest in your growth, right? So for me, it's not just for our internals, but we I want to do the same thing. So in our in our 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 IT contracts, as we're looking for the next generation of companies to support our efforts, I want them to know not only are we using Pluralsight, these are the channels we're using for the positions that you're going to be putting support in for it. To me, that's how we build that workforce. And it doesn't matter what your age or knowledge is when you come in. Yeah, I'll turn it over to, to to Lester to finish on this on this question. Uh, but maybe I just add a friendly amendment. Instead of legacy employee, why don't we call them seasoned and wise? Uh, seasoned and wise, I like it. Seasoned okay. and wise. Seasoned and wise. Okay. So so um so so Roger had a great answer, and and um, 
and, and what he's trying to do is a step beyond, I think, where where our next next step is going to be. Yeah, as part of the IT workforce strategy that we developed, um, we recognized that there were certain cultural changes that we needed to to uh, to support within the Office of Systems in order to to achieve some of what we want to achieve. One of those one of those cultural changes is this drive to um, to self initiate training and is the drive for people to express their desires for where they want to go. And, and, and I mean, I'm not. A, People aren't talking so much about careers, like where they want to be in 10 years. They they they're thinking more about what they want to do next, and so okay. giving them more of an opportunity to to move around. Uh, we've always had a great deal of respect for people who've been working in these in our in our major systems for 30 years. They are, you know, they are the people who keep it all together, um, and, and and we res and we respect them all. Um, but we we're also building respect for the people who are more. Um, flexible in the technology they work with, who have more more broad techno technological backgrounds, who may not be the expert in the area, but but who are able to bring together ideas from different perspectives, from different kinds of technologies, and um, and and who take it on themselves to um, to get this ad hoc training. Now they've been doing a lot of these people have been doing it for some time, right? They'll they'll go out to wherever they go um, and, and get training um, on you know. Um, on the internet, right? And or when they face a problem, they'll go out and look at a YouTube to fix that specific problem, um, because that's what they've always done. Um, what we're what we're doing now is 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 providing them with with Pluralsight um, to be able to go out and 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 take it in a more structured way themselves. Um, and and we need to find a way to recognize that. Now, now we have an agency skills inventory for IT, um, where every where it it had been that managers would would uh, assess their their people. Um, we're changing it now so that people can assess themselves, and then if there's a difference between the two, that's a that's a basis for a conversation, and it's also a basis for um, the individual expressing what they want to do next, and um, and and that is part of driving toward that cultural change, making the the uh, uh, the training available, being explicit about uh, people having time to do it, um, moving toward being explicit about our expectation for people to do it, and and to develop a, a broader base. Um, you know, the the legacy, uh, you know, that's our meat and potatoes. If we if our legacy systems go down, you know, social security, social security goes down. Um, our our more recent work is the work that's been getting a lot more attention inside and outside. It's it's in the cloud. It's it's using um, you know um, Node.js and and uh, Postgres uh, for for the databases. Or we're moving. We're, we we haven't developed anything new in COBOL in, in quite a while. You know, thank, thankfully. Um, but but DB2 is still is still the foundation of our main databases, and with our volumes, with our transactions, not number of transactions, it, it's a place that we haven't quite figured out how to get off of yet. And 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 so we're building these hybrid systems. You need all of these skills in these hybrid systems. We 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 don't want to neglect the continued well-being of everybody who's 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 keeping the back end running. Um, and, but um, at the same time, providing up people opportunities to to move to the to the newer technologies and and doing it on their own initiative, so you don't have to be nominated as a uh, reward for something. You might say it's a an orchestra of skills and experiences, right? Yeah, uh, both of you. And so uh, you can see why I'm so excited about what's going on at, at Social Security and FBI. Uh, they're lucky to have you as uh, as IT execs who are, who are driving some really interesting uh, workforce and, and talent strategies. Uh, it's it's interesting times in in, in government and, and and in industry too. Uh, so I, I hope folks will will uh, for those outside listeners uh, consider uh, careers in in these two organizations because uh, it's something we're absolutely uh, re recruiting for, but we're also uh, really excited about the existing uh, uh, public servants who work day in day out to keep these critical systems going, keep the country safe, and 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 provide that important uh, safe safety net. So a huge thank you to the both both of you uh, for all for all that you do for spending some time with us, and thank you to everyone who tuned in today. All right, and one last pitch: if you if you're applying for Social Security, you want to interact with us, go online. Uh, that's uh, we're we're, we're going to give it all to you there, so you can, you can do everything you need online. SSA.gov. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick.